Good morning, good afternoon, everybody um, from, from um, all over the world. Um, this is our second edition of the case competition focus on Africa. We've extended it to the Middle East um, for this competition. We're excited. We have myself, Farouk, as well as... Um, again, good morning, welcome. I'm Hansel Otero. I'm a pediatric radiologist here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I say good morning because it's a nice and sunny morning in Philadelphia. And um, we have a, a very exciting agenda. Um, we have um, 19 cases that are um, really amazing cases. Like it's, it's always a pleasure to see like the submissions and to go through the process and uh, see these cases even before they are shown here. Um, we receive for this uh, edition, we receive uh, almost 60 cases and uh, I think we counted 17 countries. So uh, again, it's excited to see so much rep uh, representation and, and the good work that we, that we as a community or that um, are, are doing um, you know, outside the traditional axis of uh, the US and Europe. So, with that in mind, um, we're gonna get started, so let's get. Right, so to, to kick this off today, we have a very special, special guest, um, somebody that a lot of us probably know. This is somebody I look up to personally. You know, I, I, I consider him a, a big brother. Um, I'm talking about the one and only Frank Minger. I've never met him in person, but you know, <laughs> the way I talk about him, you think we're um, we're cousins. Um, but um, I've got the chance to work with him on a few um, projects. Everybody knows his, you know, his groundbreaking work with the uh, Roto IR with um, Fabian and the rest of his um, colleagues. You know, um, in addition to that, we know he's the program director for the RSNA Global Learning Center in Tanzania. We know he's a, you know, he's a hero in this country and. Um, and, you know, becoming more of a hero in the continent of, of um, Africa. He's a trailblazer for education. Um, so with that being said, um, I'm going to hand over to Frank Menger for, um, to give our keynote speech. Thank you very much, Farouk. Uh, are my slides showing okay? <clears throat> Farouk, are my slides showing okay? Uh, no, we're we're not seeing them yet, uh, Frank. <clears throat> Okay, Frank, now you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, are we good there? Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Farouk, for that very uh, kind uh, introduction. Really, it's my honor to uh, present uh, uh, to you guys uh, this morning to kick off this session. Um, really, um, <laughs> It, it, it's been like an amazing time, but I just want to kind of start from the outset, uh, uh, introduce myself. My name is Dr. Frank Minger. I'm a neuroideologist uh, based uh, at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, <clears throat> most of the work I'm presenting here represents really the effort of a ton of people. Uh, so really it's my distinct honor to just share uh, some of the lessons that we've had along the way, uh, what we're trying to address. Um, and while some of it may look like, you know, pretty amazing, I, I just want all of you to hear opportunity. Uh, and that uh, this work is far from done. Um, there's a lot of like stuff that's still uh, are pending. Uh, so while we are kind of like exploring some of the lessons we've had over the last couple of years, uh, really uh, please uh, understand this is a work in progress and all of you can contribute to make it uh, better. So really the question we're gonna try to address uh, is uh, <clears throat> radiology in the developing world. Uh, is it possible to bridge uh, the training gap? And I'll just uh, start from the very, uh, and saying that it is indeed possible. And uh, what we're gonna explore today is the neuroradiology training program that we have in Tanzania. And I'll kind of take you through that and hopefully through 
the lens of that program, uh, you'll begin to understand why I think that it is indeed possible to bridge the uh, training gap. So no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, this is going to be the outline of our talk. We're gonna basically address uh, uh, what is the scope of this lack of specialty training programs in Africa. We're gonna talk about our two-year new radiology fellowship at MOHAS, and also we're gonna touch on the RSNA Global uh, Learning Center. <clears throat> so on this, <clears throat> So as of uh, 2021, only 18 out of 54 countries in Africa have a diagnostic radiology residency training program. So basically, if you live in Africa, only a third of the countries have an opportunity for you actually to do even basic uh, diagnostic radiology uh, uh, residency training. And then of those, only five of them have a radiology fellowship program. So if you finish your three to four year residency training program, <clears throat> what are the opportunities to kind of advance yourself? Only five countries offer that. And of those five countries, they're indeed Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and South Africa. And so this is what it looks like on a map. So this is a, a map of the continent, obviously, and the countries in yellow are the 18 countries that have uh, existing diagnostic radiology uh, training programs. And you can see uh, this only about a third of the continent are covered. And then when you go and ask uh, which of these countries have fellowship programs, you uh, stumble on these five countries, uh, which are Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and, uh, and South Africa. And, uh, <clears throat> and a footnote here is that the programs in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania have only been established in the last five to 10 years. So this is like a very new phenomenon. Uh, it's a work in progress. So there's a lot of things that we need to learn because indeed the, the problem is simple. We need to kind of scale up these programs, but it's not very easy to know uh, how to do that. And that's where like all of us need to participate in thinking creatively about how we might be able to uh, bridge this training uh, gap. So we use Tanzania as an example. I'm from Tanzania. Uh, it's a country in East Africa, just south of Kenya. Population is 60 million. We just had our census this year uh, and probably projections that we're gonna be uh, somewhere near 70 to 80 million people. GDP per capita just north of $1,000. Median age is 18 years compared to the United States where the median age is 38 years. So about 20 years younger <laughs> as a country. And uh, in general, the continent itself is about 20 years younger uh, than uh, US and uh, Western Europe for that matter. Our life expectancy is 65 years. That is about probably uh, 10 to 15 years uh, less than the life expectancy uh, in the US and uh, Western, uh, Western Europe. So here's another way to look at that problem, focusing on, on Tanzania. Here are the actual numbers of radiologists in Tanzania since our about independence. So we had independence uh, from <coughs> the United Kingdom uh, in uh, 1961. At that point, we only had two radiologists. And for the next four decades, we essentially had single digit radiologists for the entire, uh, entire nation. But this didn't really begin to change until about 2010, because in the early 2000s, we actually started to establish our radiology residence training program with the help of Norway. And then uh, after that, our numbers began to basically uh, explode from there. And so basically on average, Every five years since 2010, we've sort of been on a doubling, you know, that's kind of like the doubling rate. And uh, basically by 2020, when we looked at this, we have about a hundred radiologists uh, for the entire country of Tanzania. So basically you're kind of looking at a hundred radiologists for a population of anywhere from like 60 to 70 million people. Compare that to the US, this is a 10 X problem. So again, um, the problem is simple in terms of like what is actually missing, what is missing are training programs, right? So, but how do you actually uh, uh, establish those training programs? How do you maintain those training programs? How do you make sure that you can get both scale and quality? That is a major problem. And it's actually a major problem, not just in Tanzania, also in Africa. When you look at it, even in the United States and the United Kingdom, you will see there's a big uh, a shortage of radiologists, ironically, even though they have 10 times more than the radiologists uh, in, in Tanzania. So we started embarking on this uh, journey back in 2017, where we did a, a, a needs assessment. And this was actually looking uh, specifically for a, a interventional radiology program. And what we discovered was, you know, to our surprise, we have the imaging equipment. So we have 128 slice, 64 slice CT. We have 1.5 T MRI, 3 T MRI. We have an angiography suite. And most of this equipment is very similar to many of the academic, uh, major academic uh, medical centers here in the United States. And we had, guess what, a large diagnostic radiology, radiology residency program, which was 
a three-year program with more than 60 residents. I mean, that is comparable to the number of residents I have here at Emory University. And for neuroradiology specifically, there was a busy neurosurgery and neurology clinical service. However, there was no neuroradiologist or specialty uh, training uh, program. And again, this is just a, a, a quick uh, uh, encapsulation. This is a Loganzilla campus of the Mwimbili National Hospital. It's a replica hospital of a hospital uh, out in Seoul, uh, South Korea. And is basically a replica brick by brick all the way to an escalator, right? So we have a, such a fancy hospital, even we have like an escalator in the hospital, the equipment is up to date. But again, what is missing here, what is missing is the number of so specialists to actually deliver that tertiary level care uh, that our nation uh, needs. And so that's where we embarked on basically trying to establish these subspecialty training programs. And now I'm going to talk about our two-year neuroradiology uh, fellowship at Mohas. So <clears throat> this story has to be understood because we really started with the interventional radiology training program. And here we kind of wrote up our experience uh, training the first generation of interventional uh, radiologists. Uh, and we can basically explain how our model works. And this is the early days back in October 2017. And this was actually the trip where we actually uh, came with my colleague who's now faculty at Yale, uh, Fabian Lagab, who was a resident then, but now is a first year attending uh, interventional radiologist at Yale. And uh, we have here one of our first trainees, Eric Mbuguje. We have Ivan Rukundo, who has gone back to Rwanda and is trying to establish a training program there. We have Dr. Aza Naif, who's also an attending together with Eric at Mwimbili National Hospital. And this is one of my uh, previous neuroradiology fellows, Kenny Dufoyong, uh, who was a neuroradiology fellow at that time at Yale. And this picture is really has a lot of like information here. One, <laughs> it seems like many, many eons ago and we've aged over the last like five years or so. But what Eric is showing here, this is like a chicken gauze basically contraption that we actually used to do one of the first CT guided uh, biopsy devices. And basically we use this to kind of basically give us a bit of a grid. And these obviously the metal markers are basically able to show us how we can successfully perform that CT guided biopsy. But the point here is even back then in 2017, we had very eager residents who already had the creativity and could see the potential for interventional radiology training program. So how does that program actually work out? So Fabian, when he came with us, he didn't stop at that needs assessment. He spent the next year figuring out how can we actually solve that problem? Again, the problem is actually straightforward, is the lack of this opportunity for training. And so the crux of the matter here is how do you address that? We had to basically establish teaching teams and send them to Tanzania. And this is the first visiting teaching team back in October, 2018. It was a massive team. Half of these folks are interventional radiology team and half of these folks are diagnostic radiology uh, uh, team. And we also have technologists, we have like nurses uh, and spouses are included in this particular uh, team. And so this is how that rhythm works. Basically it's a two week uh, visiting schedule. They arrive the weekend before, get picked up from the airport and get oriented. And then Monday to Friday, they're basically running the rotation the same way they'll run the rotation in the United States, uh, starting with a morning case discussion, followed by procedures and lectures. And then the weekend, we always make sure you take advantage of the fact that in Tanzania, we have some really beautiful tourist opportunities, both in Zanzibar and a safari to the Ngorongoro Serengeti. So basically they leave a Friday afternoon uh, and they go to these folk places and come back Sunday night uh, ready to basically get started the next week, Monday to Friday, where they do the morning case discussion procedures and lectures. And usually the Friday or Saturday, just before they leave, we have a handoff conference call with the next incoming team. So basically using this schedule, we basically hope that we would basically cycle these teaching teams at least 10 times a year. So the idea was to send 10 teams a year. And basically if over the two-year training program, the, our interventional radiology fellows would get uh, 20 weeks of coverage by these uh, specialists from various places. And this is how it worked out in 2018. We had folks from all over the United States, from Yale, Emory, Utah, Kansas, Harvard, uh, Cornell, uh, New Orleans, Yale again, and, and NYU. And since uh, 2018, we've actually sent more than 50, like five zero uh, um, uh, teams uh, to Tanzania uh, on these uh, teaching expeditions. And uh, we've been able to graduate uh, our uh, first cohort graduated uh, last year, and our second cohort of seven trainees is graduating this year. So basically, uh, at the end of this year, we would have produced 10 new interventional radiology uh, uh, attendings uh, from basically zero back in uh, 2017. So again, given all of this momentum, that is what took us to basically start the neuroradiology uh, training program. 
And here we submitted this curriculum, which was approved, and then we embarked on that program. So the program, again, is designed over two years. It's a four semester uh, 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 program. And basically, um, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's after three years of radi radiology residency uh, are required. And this basically, this will be a three plus two uh, training program. And again, the emphasis here is on competency-based clinical training. This is not just reading from the books. This is actually doing the work because what we're trying to do here is create neuroradiologists who are actually gonna do the neuroradiology work uh, that's required uh, in Tanzania. So the program has a didactic component, a clinical apprenticeship, has a longitudinal clinical research project uh, slash publication. It actually has three formal evaluations per semester. So each semester, we have the opportunity to examine our fellows and see if they're progressing as we kind of expect them. So roughly speaking, here's the curriculum get broken up. So we start with some neuroanatomy, congenital anomalies, and then neuroideology physics and techniques in the first semester. And then in the second semester, they're gonna do brain uh, stroke and uh, hemorrhage, cerebrovascular diseases. We're also gonna focus on brain infections in the second semester. The third semester, we're gonna go into brain neoplasms. And also we're gonna introduce spine imaging disorders and diseases. And uh, in the fourth semester, we get into brain, white matter, metabolic diseases. We also cover a lot of pediatric uh, uh, material during that fourth semester. And also we venture out into head and neck disorders and diseases. And all the while they're doing their uh, longitudinal clinical audit uh, uh, project and they finish with a write-up and submission in their fourth uh, semester. The didactic component, basically uh, the fellows prepare these didactic presentations and they're monitored by staff at Muimbili. But also this is supplemented by online uh, lectures, our RSNA Global Learning Center and Health for the World and we've got a bunch of textbooks, and also they have access to uh, articles from AJNR, neurographics, and radiographics, uh, thanks to the RSNA Global Learning Center, which I'll explain uh, momentarily. So this is kind of how it works, where they're kind of doing that didactic component. So they're presenting a PowerPoint uh, uh, case. Here's Dr. Mwajabu Saleh and Dr. Ogumba Kukima, uh, together with their mentor, Dr. Mango, uh, Menkris Mango, who's basically supervising them on site at, uh, at uh, Mwimbili. Uh, in addition, though, these fellows are actually embedded within the clinical service at Mwimbili Orthopedic Institute. So all they do is read neuroradiology cases, the same way our fellows here at Emory would be doing. And so they are embedded in the case. But in addition to that, what we have are weekly case reviews uh, via online facts and Zoom platforms. Again, uh, we hadn't had a chance to really do a lot of uh, uh, in-person travel because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really leaned a lot on online facts and Zoom platforms to basically execute on these weekly case uh, review sessions. And basically this is kind of how it works. Again, at the workstation teaching, we really emphasize that because again, it's a clinical apprenticeship, right? So well, they are reviewing cases and, and you can see that the cases are quite challenging. These are not a simple sort of like, you know, headache or vertigo type cases. These are tertiary uh, care level cases and they're very, very challenging. Even when we take them during that weekly case didactic review, those sessions can be actually more challenging than the cases I encounter on my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, practice. So this is like just a historical note. This is a letter uh, inviting Dr. Mekris Mango, who you just saw back in 2012, where I was still at the Yale University. And we were just happy that he would come and do a clinical observership uh, in our neuroradiology section there. So we spent three months with us, just observing us how we were doing. And again, guess what? 10 years later, he's now supervising our fellows on site at Mwimbili. So it's very, very gratifying and he's really come through for us in a major, major ways. And I, I can't thank him enough for staying engaged. So how does this look? In the first year of neuroradiology, uh, we had 50 uh, case review sessions. Uh, we review more than 250 uh, cases. So that's individual consultations, about five to six cases per session. But each trainee separate, uh, you know, besides these 250 cases, they reviewed a thousand cases that year for each neuroideology fellow. And we were able to do one uh, rad path correlation conference. We're hoping to do more of this because we really want to uh, big up that uh, uh, multidisciplinary care and bring that uh, practice uh, to Tanzania uh, uh, moving, moving forward. In addition, they had uh, two midterms up a semester and one final examination. Our exams consist of multiple choice questions that have written and oral examinations for our US uh, residents and fellows. Uh, we kind of do the old school orals where we actually are able to really test a lot and really kind of push our fellows uh, uh, in ways in which uh, uh, you're not really able to do very well on the multiple choice test. But again, the emphasis here is on building competent colleagues. So it's very important for us to actually understand 
whether they're able to do the work of being neuroradiologists and not so much uh, passing examinations. So the longitudinal clinical research project, uh, basically uh, for this, uh, we were trying to establish a brain tumor registry and a stroke patient registry. So these basically were meant to kind of help us build infrastructure for future research. Again, as we build more capacity towards uh, having more neuroradiology fellows, we're gonna be in an opportunity to, to really do longitudinal research and actually begin to answer uh, some of the important research questions uh, that we should be answering within our own uh, context. Uh, I am very proud of Dr. Amoyabu Saleh, because she was able to actually submit and uh, get a, a case publication. Uh, this is actually a, a TB lesion and an immunocompetent patient, which you wouldn't really think about. If we showed the images here, when you go to the case report, most of folks in the US would say, this is a clear case of a glioblastoma multiforme. And again, you wouldn't think about uh, tuberculosis and an immunocompetent patient. And again, this was in the first case actually reported in Tanzania, uh, so again, for cases where tuberculo tuberculosis is endemic, you can get these uh, extra pulmonary uh, manifestations. And so we added to that sort of uh, uh, ring enhancing differential of magic doctor to actually magic doctor T uh, to basically think of tuberculosis when you have a large uh, ring enhancing lesion. So again, the point here is our fellows are now beginning to contribute to knowledge uh, creation, which is super, super exciting. And as you guys were gonna see today, from these uh, case presentations. There is a wealth of knowledge that should be coming from Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere that we could be learning from. So even though we are doing training, we're actually learning a lot by engaging in this space. And, uh, uh, and it's very, very exciting. Uh, and I hope that uh, many of the case uh, uh, presentations today will actually go forth and become actually case reports so the entire world can benefit from your hard work. So going to the RSNA uh, a Global uh, Learning Center, okay? So RSNA, as you know, is uh, the Radiological Society of North America. It has more than 48,000 members in 145 countries. It's a massive, massive society, okay? So this is a great opportunity because all of these members are quite engaged and this is the pool of talent that may help us actually scale these training programs. So uh, back in uh, uh, 2018, 2019, the RSNA basically established these RSNA Global Learning Centers and the idea was to basically establish regional centers of excellence in radiology education. And Tanzania was fortunate to be one of the second global learning centers after the first global learning center in South Africa, which is based at the Stellenbosch uh, University. But now uh, we have uh, three uh, global learning centers. The third one I believe is in Ecuador and the fourth one will be announced uh, uh, shortly. And so we were super excited actually to be selected uh, to be part of this uh, global learning center. And I'm even more excited and honored to be the director for this global learning center. And our agenda was to basically build on the work that we had done with interventional radiology by establishing additional so specialty training programs. And now we have this new radiology training program that's gonna be graduating our first uh, uh, cohort this year. And we're hoping to also establish the, a women's imaging fellowship, uh, which will embark on this coming year in November, where we'll establish our first uh, our cohort. So really, we are using the opportunity that the RSNA Global Learning Center and the resources that they provide to really turbocharge our subspecialty uh, training uh, uh, programs. So what did this afford us? This basically allowed us to expand from two to 12 neuroradiology faculty, who I'll share with you shortly. Uh, we went from two virtual case review sessions uh, by the two faculty mentors. We, we basically uh, were bootstrapping this every Tuesday and Thursday. And now we basically have uh, sessions every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday without miss. And so basically our fellows are able to get three uh, consults slash virtual case review sessions by the 12 uh, faculty mentors. And this is essentially what we're trying to uh, uh, simulate here. So this is myself uh, back uh, last year, October, November, where I'm sitting uh, at the Mwimbili National Hospital. To my right is Dr. Gumba Kukima and Dr. Mojabu Saleh, our second year fellows who are gonna be graduating. On my right here is uh, Dr. Hamim Rusheki. It was actually as a case presentation you guys will see uh, later today. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mariam Tolera, who is our uh, first year also uh, uh, joining. So basically what we're trying to do is simulate workstation teaching. And again, this may be a, somewhat of a, uh, a, a dying art, but I really believe in this because I learned a lot of neuroradiology uh, by just being at the workstation and uh, talking through your thought process, your approach to cases, and uh, so forth. I mean, now we're doing this via Teams. 
and other sort of virtual platforms. But I think uh, being there in person, you really can uh, get a lot from these uh, teaching uh, sessions. Again, because we couldn't uh, do these sessions as often, we basically uh, tried to do this online. And so what would happen is our fellows would actually create a case summary. And as you can see here, we have this uh, extra axial uh, mass, pretty uh, sizable mass at the frame and uh, magnum, and it's uh, pressing on the uh, cervical medullary junction. Okay, and right, and you can see it has somewhat of like a restricted diffusion and it has avid enhancement. So this will be probably a case of meningioma, but it's just one example of the kind of cases that we see. You can see uh, obstructive uh, hydrocephalus as well for this case. So again, uh, Dr. Ogumba prepared this case and basically presented it as a summary. But when this gets presented, the faculty is actually able, not only that, not only do they create a case summary, and this will be basically what we would want for our tumor boards here in the United States is for these to basically be presented to us in summary fashion, should you know what the clinical question is. And by the way, the fellows put in the patient information, put a differential diagnosis, they put a final diagnosis, and also we force them to put the next step in management. And this is really the crux of the training program, right? It's not about getting your examination answer correctly, it's about basically how are you working through each of your cases? So are you able to describe the imaging findings correctly? Are you able to generate a reasonable differential diagnosis? Are you able to come up with a correct final diagnosis? And even more important, are you able to guide the next step in management? And basically all of our testing is basically based on this. We give them a case and see how well they can step through these particular steps uh, for their particular case. And then the faculty who's doing this virtually is gonna get the full case, a DICOM set on, uh, on AMBRA platform. Again, it's just, you can use any other platform. That's the platform that we're using. And they're able to scroll through the cases, they're able to window through the cases, do whatever you would do at any workstation uh, here in the United States. And it actually works uh, pretty, pretty well. Uh, the, uh, the program is a uh, pretty uh, robust. And this is a major step forward from all the little like WhatsApp type consults where you get like a screenshot of some like, you know, twisted image and you're not really sure, but yet you're supposed to give an, an expert opinion. And I really uh, caution us that we have to move away from these casual consults to actually a full consult. Again, this is a brain tumor. So you can't have a brain tumor just being like curbside over what's up. We really have to do it properly. And I think some of these are ways in which we can begin to elevate uh, the level of consultation we're providing. So again, uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Bruno Policeni. So I really thank him a lot because basically we struggled through the first 12 to 18 months uh, mentoring our first uh, uh, first year uh, our two fellows, basically with our virtual uh, case review sessions uh, twice a week, Tuesday, Thursdays. But quickly, when we uh, uh, had our uh, second class enroll, we needed more help, and so stepped in uh, Dr. Risto Filippi, and he really helped with us. But most importantly, Dr. Risto Filippi and the RSNA helped us to expand our reach. And now we have 12 neuroradiology faculty. And I just wanna pause here for a second, because really for those of you who are not in neuroradiology, you may not realize that you're really looking at some of the luminaries uh, in uh, neuroradiology. Uh, uh, these are really people on top of their game. Many of them are department chairs. Dr. Risto Filippi is the chair of uh, uh, radiology at Tufts University. Dr. Jim Abrahams is uh, my uh, fellowship director <laughs> back in Yale. So it's uh, quite uh, interesting that now I'm the fellowship director and he's one of my uh, faculty. And that just goes to show how the world is a big circle and things come around. I mean, um, Dr. Suresh Mukherjee is a big uh, shot in a uh, head and neck radiology. And Dr. Rajan Jain is a big shot in a brain tumor. But all of these uh, faculty are really outstanding and preeminent faculty from the RSNA. They're also members of, uh, of uh, ASNR. So it's really just an amazing group of faculty. And really many of them are so enthusiastic. They wanna basically give more than you know two, three sessions that we actually offer them. So, I mean, it's almost, I have to kind of hold them back. I mean, that's the level of enthusiasm that we have. So really, really, truly best to have this uh, cohort. I also wanna show the number of institutions involved. So we have Emory, Iowa, Tufts, Yale, Michigan, New York, Toronto, Hopkins, North Carolina, Michigan, NYU, and even private practice with Kaiser uh, Permanente are involved. So I guess just to, to show that one, it takes a village to execute on this kind of work. And really the RSNA has been instrumental in basically allowing us to begin to scale uh, some of our efforts. And so this is just this past August, uh, one month ago where we had Dr. Risto Filippi uh, down at uh, Mwimbili actually doing exactly what I was doing uh, last year, basically reviewing cases. And you can see here, Dr. Ogumba, Dr. Mwadiabu, uh, Dr. Hamimo, Dr. Maria. Again, he was doing board review just before we actually did 
uh, oral examinations uh, for them uh, that uh, uh, August uh, uh, this uh, past year. And I'm pleased to report that both Dr. Ogumba and Mwajabu Saleh did very well and passed their examinations. Uh, and again, it was such a blessing to have Dr. Risto, who's basically been working with these fellows for almost six months, to actually meet them in person and, and actually kind of like, you know, talk through the cases. And again, I can't emphasize that sort of solidarity and really kind of showing them how you're struggling through cases, because sometimes they'll show you a case. And even though you've been a practicing radiology professor for like many years, you can be stumbled. But again, it's just important for us to model how do you deal with a case that you may not understand or you may not have the final answer, what's the next step and, and so forth. Um, and so what are the main lessons learned? So the main lessons here that I would uh, uh, submit, uh, basically curriculum-based training is essential for rigor and sustainability. Again, we need to move away from the global health uh, uh, efforts where you kind of just uh, parachute in for like a week or two. Um, and then basically you're not really linked to any curriculum based training and we recognize this because I was involved a lot in radiology residency training where we would come and we would give like a, hey here's an MRI of the knee or MRI of the shoulder lecture and you can just see the residents glaze over because I've heard the same lecture like five times from like different uh, 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 faculty who have basically been rotating uh, through the institution. So again I would say moving forward we really should benchmark training efforts uh, uh, to curriculum base. Is there a curriculum that's approved and are you trying to basically supplement that curriculum? Number two, the program actually provides a second opinion consultation service. So basically now we're able to basically inject three weeks, I mean, three days of uh, basically uh, uh, consultation uh, for the Mwimbili National Hospital. So basically if there's any difficult case that they encounter in neuroradiology, they know that they're gonna have an expert with them Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday without fail and even additional if, if they need for the difficult uh, cases. So while the fellows are doing the bulk of the work, they have backup and they also get learning from that. So the point here is that in-country training has major benefits, both for the patients, because one, it improves a local practice. Again, these are not fictitious, fictitious patients, these are real patients. And again, these patients would get a read uh, no matter what. So basically the ability for us to kind of plug in and offer uh, an additional expertise, it's only gonna benefit the patients. And at the same time, it improves our pre uh, training. So both we're providing training and also improving local practice compared to training abroad where one, you may do a, a, an observership, you may not have the opportunity to actually dictate or actually uh, interact with the patients directly. And again, the cases may be different. So you actually practicing on the patients that you're going to see when you graduate, you're going to meet the same patient populations, the same challenges, uh, that you have. So I think that has a lot of benefits. And again, it's very rare to have the opportunity to actually train hands on outside your own country. So I can't emphasize that. And I really think like moving forward to the rest of the continent and other countries, uh, lower to middle income countries, this may be a model to move forward. So again, we kind of wrote up these lessons in an article recently uh, published, uh, uh, basically talking about the dawn of the training programs. And here we kind of talk about our experience in Tanzania uh, but also uh, touching on, on uh, Kenya and Ethiopia as basically trying to compare and contrast. And really the same lessons uh, come through and I highly encourage those who are interested in this space to take a look at this very short article. I think it's only like two pages or so where we kind of line up like the, the major points are here. But really this is the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter is we need to be creating our colleagues, okay? So long gone are the days where you will go and kind of just do a little bit of like point of care ultrasound. Maybe you'll give a little bit of a, a lecture of the MRI of the knee or shoulder or spine or whatever it is. We have to create people who can take care of us, right? So that's a very different paradigm and it does take a different uh, level of engagement. But this uh, picture here shows that it's possible. Uh, and you can see here, Dr. Mango, their supervisor, you have here Dr. Mboko, the head of uh, radiology at uh, 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 Muhas, and you have here Dr. Ogumba and Dr. Mwajabu Saleh, who are going to be our first graduates this coming uh, November. And then we have uh, Dr. Maria and Dr. Hamim, who are uh, first years now rising, uh, second years. And we have uh, Dr. Hilda and Dr. Saleh, who are basically now are going to be registering as first years this coming November. So basically, you're seeing the first three cohorts of uh, neuroradiologists uh, uh, trained in Tanzania on this particular picture, and you have myself and Dr. Risto Filippi here, we're just celebrating uh, Dr. Ogumba and Dr. Mojabu Saleh successfully completing uh, their training uh, program. So again, to, to, to the extent that we can sort of replicate this in, across other countries, across other specialty uh, training programs, I think it will be very, very gratifying. And again, I can't well wait to welcome our colleagues 
uh, both to the profession, but also welcome them to the United States, to our meetings, and so we can continue to collaborate and, uh, and uh, take care of patients uh, moving forward. So again, acknowledgements. Again, I, I can't thank enough Dr. Mojabu Saleh and Dr. Obumba Kukima because they gave us the chance to try out uh, this particular unique uh, training program. Again, there is no blueprint for this kind of training program, but again, we're beginning to show that it actually can yield some results. And again, Dr. Mango, Dr. Mboka, Dr. Musa Baloa, who's my co-director for the RSNA Global Learning Center based in Tanzania, and Dr. Bruno Policeni, who really helped me to kind of like flesh out how to build up this neuroradiology uh, fellowship training program. Again, you know, the, they are super grateful and they kind of like, you know, made this uh, cake uh, for us, uh, uh, you know, last year when we uh, um, I, I went for like a visit and it basically says, uh, thank you, professor, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our local uh, vernacular. So that's uh, really, really grateful. So you can go there for the cake or you can actually go there for this actually uh, a teaching team. And uh, again, I really thank you for your attention. And I hope some of you will join us because again, the journey for us was just to get to maybe 10X, but I really believe if all of us are be, uh, subscribed to this paradigm change, maybe we'll get to like 100X and really actually solve this problem and really engage in this super exciting space. So I really, really thank you for your attention. Uh, happy to connect uh, either via email or via Twitter, uh, uh, which whatever questions you may have. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present here. And uh, really thank you for representing the work that many of us uh, are doing. And uh, I thank you so much, uh, both Hansel and uh, Farouk uh, for the honor to uh, share our story. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Frank. That was an excellent presentation. And I think that it, it will get um, more than one inspired to, you know, for most of us, it's just continuing this journey of trying to um, bring um, more advanced education to more places. There are a number of questions in the chat, but before um, we go into some of them and just really quickly, I, I wanted to ask one that is a little bit more personal. One issue that we have uh, in recruiting uh, fellows and, or, or trying to keep people in training for longer. It's like how you um, justify extra training um, when you know, we are all eager to you know, finish residency and start you know, our jobs and for, for the majority of uh, radiologists in the world, this means uh, joining private practice. So how do you justify the, first the need and then how do you do a little bit like the finances of keeping people for longer? Yeah, so um, I, I would just say that, uh, so in Tanzania, the, uh, the general radiology residency training program is only three years. So I think very quickly, um, the radiologists themselves realize the limits of what they know. <laughs> okay. So you don't have to convince them too much, right? So, I mean, radiology, as you know, is a vast field and to be able to practice through the entire spectrum just based on three years of training um, uh, is not possible. So that's one. Uh, two, I think many of them also realize that again, like same as us in the US, that really we're moving towards a specialty practice, right? So really the general radiologist, uh, it's gonna be a little bit of a rare, uh, a rarer breed, especially if you're training, if you're practicing sort of in academic type setting. So maybe in a community type setting, uh, general skills will be like, you know, more valid, but in the tertiary setting, certainly, getting some specialty training is gonna be super beneficial. And I think the issue here, Hansel, more than anything is people wanna to continue to learn. I think that is probably the most uh, um, uh, gratifying and I think that's probably the highest motivation. People just wanna keep growing. And I think that's also why most of us are in academia to begin with is because you keep getting challenged, you keep seeing new stuff. And I think at the end of the day, yes, the, the, you do have to pay the bills, but I think there's also, you gotta like have fun in what you do. And I think like learning is a lot of fun. Um, and um, before, again, I, um, just to clarify, like we have too, probably too many questions. So some of the questions we'll email you later and we'll um, give you some contact information to try to get you um, to answer these questions. Um, there, is, there was one question that I find really interesting because it's, a, it's, a, like, it's an opportunity. Um, Michael Hartung to ask um, what PAX platform you use, like was this donated and, um, and um, how, if there are resources about to start a, 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 a diagnostic uh, radiology training program from scratch. And, um, and as you answer that, and the, his third question was, is there a model curriculum or a new or existing diagnostic radiology residency? 
while you answer that, it's a great opportunity to give a big shout out to our guest, Josh, that is Karen Chikuti. She's in Malawi and she's just starting a residency from scratch right there. And uh, we know that there are um, other people in the continent that are doing the same. It's happening at a very fast pace. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the big motivations to start this work for us was to try to connect you guys, like, you know, people that are, have similar interests and are doing similar things and can talk to each other about experience instead of looking back up to the U.S. like the only solution for um, how to organize training. So again, yeah. we have a special guest. Thank you because she's doing that work. And now I'm going to let you answer the questions. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, so, so, one, so, so yeah, in more practical form, I would say uh, maybe please take a look at our, our two publications. So that's one. Um, uh, so that I think that that would be probably where I would start because there are a couple of lessons that we emphasize. One is getting a curriculum vetted at the at a local institution. So I really believe in working at a teaching hospital slash medical school as a general rule, because if you're able to actually get your curriculum vetted uh, through the local institution, that is going to give it longevity, is going to give it uh, sort of uh, acceptance within, 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 within the institution. So that is probably the hardest work and that's probably the highest hurdle. But again, you don't have to reinvent the curriculum, all right? So we have a curriculum, ASNR has a curriculum. We all know what a fellow should roughly know after the end of that fellowship training. So there's no need for you to like figure it out, like specifically for Malawi, specifically for Ghana. It's, it's basically many of the same things, right? Um, uh, so, so that's one. So getting a curriculum vetted is one. Two, I think partnerships is huge, right? You are not going to be able to do this work alone, right? So you're going to have to like basically learn how to collaborate and establish collaboration. So I think many of the radiology societies are very eager to collaborate. RSNA is one of them, ASNR is another of them. Uh, there's Rad Aid uh, as an organization uh, and, and Health for the World and so forth. So again, you shouldn't be looking to kind of like do this like on your own. So you're gonna have to figure out how do you form collaboration. So I think having like strong collaborations is one. And then two, and then third, identify the trainees who are most suitable. So I think the first couple of trainees are key. And we spent a lot of time selecting the appropriate trainees because obviously you want them to be successful. You want them to be eager and so forth. So I think those three ingredients, you can probably get stuff off, off the ground. And then obviously there's always the funding challenge uh, that you kind of mentioned uh, about. Um, <laughs> uh, th th that is a tough space to navigate. We basically started with uh, online fundraising. And so you got to basically be a little bit less shy about asking for money, <laughs> plus putting in your own money if you're based in the US, just putting in a few of your own cents. I think that goes a long way. So if you're willing to contribute, uh, chances are other people will support you. And many of the volunteers will come are more than eager to kind of like support so long as they believe in what you're doing. So I think, uh, you know, it's a loaded question. I'm happy to kind of talk about specifics, uh, but indeed, um, um, uh, there's basically places to start, and those three places would be where I would put the most emphasis and the rest of it would be filling in details. Again, Frank, great, great uh, talk. Um, great uh, question, um, answer to the question. You know, we're, 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 we're past time, but just because this talk is so great and there's so many questions, we're just gonna give one more um, question a chance. I think you're on a panel, so you, you have access to the Q and A. So Got if it. you don't mind sticking around as the, you know, to answer people individually, that'd be great. But um, do you have uh, um, Napala um, Kopi asked, yeah. um, what are the plans for pediatric radiology subspecialty? And while you're answering that, somebody also asked, Veronica asked, um, I guess for the IR part, apart from imaging, do you teach any other IR procedures? I mean, I, I know the answer to that, but um, just, just answer that and then we can move on and you can answer people privately in the Q&A. Great, great. Yeah, so so to answer Veronica, yes, uh, we, we basically, uh, the IR, the interventional radiology is basically for the whole, um, the whole subspecialty. So we definitely cover biopsies, uh, uh, thrombolysis, ablation, the whole nine yards. So basically anywhere from CT guided biopsies all the way to like basically chemo embolization of liver tumors and uh, uterine fiber embolization in the full spectrum. So uh, uh, the, roughly how our interventional radiology uh, training program is built at the first semester, we focus on basically what we call basic percutaneous uh, procedures. So these will be CT guided biopsies, uh, basic drainages, and uh, basic sort of aspiration type procedures. 
And then uh, uh, the second semester will focus on more complicated percutaneous procedures. These are nephrostomy tubes, uh, biliary uh, external and internal uh, drainage uh, type uh, uh, procedures. And then basically we move into like venous and arterial access in the third semester. So again, they'll start with like a simple venous access, simple arterial uh, angiograms and so forth. And then in the fourth semester, we basically embark to do on the more uh, complicated uh, cases. And again, uh, this is limited by the availability of equipment. So I didn't go into the IR. We have some uh, challenges in terms of like sourcing appropriate equipment and so forth. And these are all things that we're basically learning, uh, basically building up a procurement uh, a, a pathway for that equipment. But again, there is no shortage of patients. There's no shortage of eager trainees. And then basically uh, we actually do have great facilities at the Mwimbili National Hospital, both through the Cardiac Institute and also the Moy Orthopedic Institute, both of which have uh, a capability of an IR. And then to answer Dr. Namalam Kopi, uh, we are working on that. Right now, I I'm just about surviving uh, a submission of a women's imaging training. <laughs> A curriculum. And once I recover from that, I'm going to start working next on a pediatric uh, radiology curriculum. Thank you so much for the questions. And I'll, I'll certainly answer uh, uh, some of them uh, online on the chat and so forth. Thank you again, Hansel. Thank you again, uh, Farouk. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing the rest of the cases. Thank you guys so much. No, thank you. And uh, Namala, we feel you. We know that pediatric radiology is one of the most important ones. So we feel you. Uh, um, so we, we're going to get us started. Um, so as, as we uh, start our, our, um, with the cases, again, remember, we receive uh, 60 or so cases. We chose what we thought would be the best, like the most interesting 20, but it was really hard. Like I, I think that uh, compared to, to previous um, editions like like we had a lot more to choose from and a lot more to consider so the competition is getting uh it's getting rough out there so um to get us started i'm going to introduce you to um monica miranda she's one of our research uh, uh postdoc here at the children's hospital of philadelphia and she's gonna get us going hello everyone so we're going to start the exciting part of the session we will start hearing cases from all of you. We're going to begin with Dr. Emmanuel Mbando. His case is about malnutrition revealing a foreign body. Um, Dr. Mbando is from Tanzania and comes from the Muhimbili University of Health and Allied Sciences. We're going to begin. Hello, my name is Emmanuel Mbando, emergency medicine resident at Mumbai University of Health and Life Sciences, there is from Tanzania. So I have interesting case presentation titled Severe Acute Malnutrition, Revealing an Asphalt Foreign Body. And my mentor is Dr. Arthur Sibila, emergency medicine physician at Mumbai National Hospital. So welcome, and I'll be sharing my slide. Uh, so so this is the case presentation of a two years old child which will, who was seen in our department, um, in the department, emergency department about six weeks ago. And uh, it was a referral from the regional hospital and proud to arrive at the emergency department. She completed the TB for six months. So the complaint was difficult in, uh, in feeding for one year and also failure to free. Right. So the child presented with the emergency department with uh, his refused to eat, a recurrent calf and poor weight gain. And the, she was also presented with his of recurrent presentation and vomiting of recent food eaten food material. It was also this accompanied with a failure to sleep of at gain eight and also progressive body malaise and fatigue, but there was no history of fever or night sweat. So in the course of this treatment, the patient was diagnosed having pulmonary tuberculosis based on clinical symptoms and the peripheral hospital and also based on the TB scoring chart. And she was initially in anti TB treatment for six months, but there was no improvement. And so the child was referred uh, to emergent uh, mobilization hospital for further management. On arrival at the emergency department, the patient was a uh, looking child, a uh, small for age. She was lethargic, drooling, sucking eyes, severe pain, with bacterial limpid in edema. And uh, on vital signs, uh, she was a high blood with a pressure of 37, uh, with blood pressure of 98 over 58 the of 102 breaths per, per minute and the spatter rate of the kidney of 33 breaths per minute, saturated 96 on room air. 
So the body weight was 7 kg uh, and the medium upper circumference was 9 cm. All of these were supposed to be severe acute malnutrition. So uh, I managed the department without uh, differential diagnosis of severe acute malnutrition, pneumonia, throughout out from non tuberculosis. processing. As I'm not even going to have diseases, I have the AIDS, electrolyte imbalances, severe anemia, and also we talk about sepsis. So what was done at the medical department, the patient, uh, we did the uh, RBG, which was 3.3, which was low. Uh, so we applied to reveal severe hypokalemia of less than 2, and the HIV test was negative. And also we did uh, the imaging, uh, which was the x-ray, and the, uh, the, chest, the chest x-ray, uh, reveal around the opaque foreign body located on the central upper chest just below the level of the stenoclavicular joint and the trachea was slightly uh, deviated to the, uh, to the right side and the right part cardiophysness. The conclusion that we had uh, was the foreign body the osphagus and right paracardiomonitis. So the patient was uh, stated on 10% uh, dextrose bolus which was given then followed by the maintenance of the nurse based on the uh, nutrition status of the patient and also the, 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 the weight. So the potassium was starting with hypokalemia protocol and the collective potassium was 3.4 and also the antibiotics or Ceftriaxone was initiated in this patient. And also we consulted the ENT team and the ENT, they came and reviewed the patient, they went to the patient, they went to the patient the theater and the attempt to remove the foreign body was done, but it was unsuccessful. And the interval finding, uh, the report that it was proboscope was revealed a minimum duration of the foreign body with a lot of collagen tissues around and the osophagus stricture in the lower tail of the esophagus. So they did an emergency gastrotomy tube for feeding, which was successful. And there, after the child was admitted to the pediatric ICU for further management. So the take home message uh, is that the recognition of uh, an amendment of the foreign body, uh, which are not uh, witnessed, is uh, still a problem. And the uh, osophagus foreign body are serious cause of morbidity and mortality if they go unnoticed. So uh, any condition treatment of spike foreign bodies is the, uh, important, you know, don't prevent the complication and serious and can be even life threatening. So radiology plays an important role in the initial diagnosis, in the cognition, also uh, initial complication and also the treatment. So uh, this is the child and in the ICU and also uh, yes, this child is in the ICU and also thank you for listening. This was a great, great case by Dr. Mando. We're going to proceed to our second case of the day. This case is about primary spinal epidural lymphoma by Dr. Afolabi Ogunleje uh, from Nigeria. And the institution is Lagos State University Teaching Hospital. I just want to remind everybody that as the presentations are going on, we have a People's Choice Award that's going to be voted for at the end. So, um, you know, make sure you're uh, taking some notes. OK. All right. Next next case. That's um, colleagues. I'm Dr. Falabi from Lagos, Nigeria. I'll be presenting to the diagnosis of primary spinal epidural lymphoma. This is a case of a 42 year old man who presented with upper back pain and tumor inspiration, difficulty in walking, constipation, overflow incontinence, and paresthesia the all duration. On examination, was conscious and worked with support. Weakness and hyperreflexia of the lower limbs was noted. No sensory of spinal tenderness was noted. MRI of the span was requested and the uh, initial was noted in the thoracic vertebra. This initial was in the epidural space and was compressing on the spinal cord. It was also intense on T2 weighted image, also intense on T1 weighted image, and it enhanced its contrast. The PM proceeded to surgery and add 
laminectomy with one section, histology of resected small review, polytrophy, and autolyzed cellular area. Then the result was inconclusive. Five months after surgery, Jack had a repeat MRI of the spine, which revealed uh, a reverse of the mass. The lesion now is now larger and it's compressing of the spinal cord. A similar lesion was noted in the lumbar spine, which was also compressing the codic The lesion was iso intense on two weighted image, iso intense on two weighted image, and enhanced with contrast. The similar lesion in the liver vertebrae was iso intense on two weighted image, iso intense on two weighted image, and also with enhanced with contrast. Only two more reports, maybe a doubt of the spinal lesion was considered. The bounce of the lumbar mass was selected because it has the same MRI features as the thoracic mass, and the risk of complication in the lower spine is far lower than that of this thoracic spine. The formal consent was taken for the cigarette biopsy. The procedure of other times were normal. The net like marker was placed over the lower back, and non contrast skull scan was done. The patient was then placed in. That's why the doctor's position with me flexed. A biopsy needle was inserted in the interspace between the spinal cord of L4 and L5 vertebra. The CT scan was done to locate the exact position of the tip of the biopsy needle. The amateur G2 cross biopsy needle was used, and two samples were collected. And these samples were sent for histology, and the histology. Report revealed an infiltration in the sacramental tumor, most likely a benign peripheral nature tumor. However, the immunochemistry results revealed a CD45 positive strong intensity screening with a distribution of 9%, which was aggressive of a non nauseous liquid. And the diagnosis of this patient is most likely primary spinal epidural lymphoma. The patient commenced chemotherapy. And he has received some courses of chemotherapy at three weeks intervals for PSCR. He has also started a second regimen with metrotexate, citramine, and hydrocortisone. He has had improvements in his clinical status since he commenced chemotherapy. He now works without support. Primary epidural lymphoma is a very rare subset of lymphoma. The diagnosis is only made in a patient with epidural lymphoma when no other lymphoma. Been identified. Often, it often manifests with symptoms of spinal cord compression as presentation, and it is managed surgically by physician and biopsy chemotherapy and radiotherapy. In conclusion, I have presented a young man with back pain, spinal cord compression symptoms. He was diagnosed with primary epidural lymphoma. The diagnosis was delayed by an inconclusive pathological diagnosis after laminectomy. And tissue resection. It was eventually diagnosed following a conventional CT guided biopsy. They are significantly improved data commencing therapy. This study underscores the importance of mid guided biopsy before surgery. Also, it is important for radiologists and physicians to include PSCR in the differential diagnosis of newly diagnosed epidural lesions. Excellent case. We will now proceed to our third case of the day. The third case is loading right now. It better be a good case if it's gonna um, take its time. But um, good cases so far. Um, 
you know, um, I just want to let everyone know that you're in great company. We have over one, about 170 people in attendance today. If you're gunning for the people's choice, it's not too late to invite your friends, you know, um, your colleagues to, to, to log on to um, check out your presentation. If you have more questions, you know, feel free to reach out to, um, in the Q&A. Um, and as well as other thoughts, you know, this is a safe space where we can um, all connect and um, discuss. So just um, hang tight for the third case, okay? Hi everyone, I am Neda Khalili and I will be presenting a rare case of mediastinal hydatid disease today. I would like to introduce my team members, Dr. Nastan Khalili and Dr. Sarah Hudson. Our patient presented to one of the hospitals affiliated to Shiraz University of Medical Sciences in Shiraz. I would also like to thank Pen Radiology and Chop Radiology for organizing this event and for giving me the opportunity to present my case today. So just an overview of where Iran is. Iran is located in the Middle East and Shiraz is a city in the southwest of Iran. A patient was admitted to Namozi Hospital. Okay, so the patient was a 32-year-old male who had fever, cough, and dyspnea for the past few weeks. He also complained of weight loss. He had no prior medical problems and did not take any medications. He had a healthy lifestyle and did not use tobacco, alcohol, or illicit drugs, and had no known family history of infectious diseases. The patient lived in a rural area in southwest Iran and worked as a rancher. On physical examination, he was febrile, lungs were clear on auscultation, and the remaining physical examination was otherwise unremarkable. Routine lab tests did not reveal any abnormalities. As part of his initial evaluation, the, the patient underwent chest imaging, which revealed mediastinal widening, as you could see here, with multiple lobulated mediastinal masses. On contrast enhanced chest CT on the coronal plane, we found multiple mediastinal cysts of various sizes encasing mediastinal vessels. Here you could see the superior vena cava, here is the aorta, and this is the pulmonary artery. There was no evidence of thrombosis, and as you could see, these are well-defined thin walled cysts with fluid attenuation and no evidence of calcification. On the axial plane, again, we saw multiple mediastinal cysts pushing the aorta anteriorly, as you could see here, with encasement of major vessels. Here you could see the right atrium and here is the left atrium. So after we found these imaging findings, we obtained high dotted disease serology tests for the patient, which were positive. No cysts were identified elsewhere in the body. And so uh, with a highly probable diagnosis of mediastinal high dotted disease, the patient was a candidate for surgery, but he refused to undergo surgery. So treatment was started with anti-helminthic drugs. And three months later, the patient had significant improvement in his symptoms and also significant decrease in the size of the cysts. So just an overview of hydatid disease. Hydatid disease is a zoonotic disease caused by the larval form of echinococcus granulosis. Humans are in infected by ingesting food contamin contaminated with parasite eggs or by direct contact with carnivores. Once infected, the most common locations in humans are the liver and the lungs. However, in some rare cases, mediastinal localization does occur although it is rare even in endemic regions. Uh, so the pathogenesis of mediastinal hydatid disease is not very well understood, but there are two hypotheses. The first one is rupture of hepatic or pulmonary hydatid cysts into the systemic circulation, and the second one is transdiaphragmatic dissemination. So patients with um, mediastinal hydatid disease have usually nonspecific symptoms, but they may also present with symptoms related to compression of the mediastinal structures, such as chest pain, dysphagia, dyspnea, dysphonia, and cough. 
So when we see a mediastinal mass on imaging, the first step is to make sure that this lesion is actually located within the mediastinum. So we want to look for air bronchograms on whether the uh, lesions are making an obtuse angle with the lungs. Once we confirm that this is a mediastinal mass, the next step is to, to see whether they, they are located in an anterior, middle, or posterior compartment. Or as in our patient, the lesions are occupying more than one compartment. In this case, we have to characterize the lesions and see whether they have fluid, fat, or vascular components. So uh, if they have fluid components, then we want to make, um, think of lymphangioma or mediastinitis. If they have fat contents, we could think of liposarcomas. And if they have vascular components, then we can think of hemangiomas. So these are the references I used. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed my talk. I would also like to thank my team members and a special thanks to Dr. Otero for his huge help. Thank you. So this was a great case by Dr. Neda Khalili from Iran. She, she comes from Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. We will proceed to our next case. Our net, next case is from Ethiopia, infected congenital hydrometrocolpus. This is presented by Dr. Bera Fenty Tekele from Bahirdar University. Present the case of infected congenital hydrometrocolpus. Um, no any disclosure. This is my outline of presentation. This is a 54 days old female infant present with progressive abdominal extension of one month. Mother had no antenatal obstetric scan. She has fever of two weeks and later developed vomiting and failure to pass faces on physical examination. She was acutely sick looking, febrile and tachycardic. Abdomen was usually distended. Investigation wise, she has leukocytes of 24,000 with neutrophilia. On abdominal ultrasound, there was bilateral moderate polycalcial dilatation and ureteric dilatation with eucodebrinous fluid. Bolus were dilated and peripheral located. A large stick abdominal pelvic mass and possible mesenteric cyst was considered. This is the CT representative imaging of the mentioned patient on scout image. As you see, the bowls are peripheral located and dilated. There is an abdominal pelvic opacity pushing the bowl anteriorly. On post contrast axial scan, there is a cystic and lobulated mass within the center of the abdomen pushing the bowl peripherally. And both kidney have moderate pervicalcial dilatation with peripheral enhancement with possible superinfection, and both ureters are dilated on the lower scan. This is sagittal image of the same patient. As on this image, you can see the rectum is posteriorly compressed by this cystic mass, and the mass extends to the pelvis, and the urinary bladder is not extended. With the assessment of bilateral pyonephrist and agaglion gigacolon, with four gastro application, she started the second opinion. Patient was on IV and maintenance fluid. Meanwhile, she developed persistent vomiting. And acute intestinal obstruction was diagnosed, and urgent laparotomy was done. The intraoperative finding was hugely distended uterus occupying the abdomen, and bolus were dilated. And persistent urogenital sinus and distal vagina was not well formed. There are about 600 ml of infected fluid aspirated from the uterus. A genoplasty was done and two placed within it. Postoperatively, fever subsided and no abdominal station, and patient discharged and referred to Black Line Hospital for further vaginal reconstructive surgery. Congenital hydrometrial corpus is a very rare condition with some case reports. It is one of the differential diagnoses for cystic abdominal mass in neonate and infants. It is an accumulation of watery fluid from the vagina and uterus on the neonatal period. Diagnosis is always difficult and late in neonate and infants. Whose clinical imaging has a role. Etiology wise, perforate hymen is the most common cause in transverse vaginal septum, distal vaginal agents, and persistent urogenital sign, also another cause. Among the cause mentioned, distal vaginal agents and persistent urogenital sinus was found in one patient. The clinical presentation patient of depend on the degree of compression of adjacent structures. Most patients can have some form of hydronephrosis. With pressure on the bowl can cause constipation, and severe compression fit can cause acute urinary retention and intestinal obstruction. Among the serious complications, renal failure and intestinal perforation are mentioned. There are some case reports in different parts of the world. 
This is a study done in 2019 in Gondor University of Southern Ethiopia, 45 day old female neonate with abdominal distension and abdominal ultrasound diagnosis of hydrometrocorpus was done by experienced radiologist and medical genital examination revealed a transverse vaginal septum as a cause of obstruction and patient was improved with surgery. Another study done in Abu Dhabi in 2080 or a two months old female infant. This infant has fetal ultrasound uh, diagnosis of abdominal cyst and postnatal ultrasound diagnosis of ovarian cyst. That's MRI was done and hydrometrocorpus was diagnosed and for this infant vaginal attrition was also found. Another study done in India in 2030 for a two-month infant, this infant has antenatal diagnosis of intraabdominal cyst and postnatal diagnosis of hyronometrial corpus with MRI was done. And again, for this infant, distal vaginal atresia and persistent regional sinus was found. The take home messages when you get a cystic abdominal mass in female neonate and infant, you have to anticipate hyronometrial corpus as a possible differential diagnosis, and meticulous genital examination should be done. And avoid laparotomy unless there is a high vaginal attrition for possible vaginal surgery. These are my references. Thank you. That wraps up our fourth case of the day. Wonderful presentation. So if you've noticed, we have had different presentations from different countries so far. Um, Tanzania, Nigeria, Iran, Ethiopia. We're going to include Botswana now. It's been very exciting to see this competition. It's getting, getting very interesting. So we will proceed with Botswana. We have Dr. Visa Imran presenting from the University of Botswana, a case on hypertensive crisis with renal insufficiency. Kidney, uh, I presented uh, at University Princess Marina Hospital. My mentor for today is Dr. Tembisile Musalakatane, who is a pediatric nephrologist at the University of Botswana. So uh, pelvic uretric junction obstruction is common, a cause of urinary obstruction in pediatrics. It's often congenital, however, it can present later in life as well. Uh, it is majorly detected uh, on the prenatal ultrasound, uh, which unfortunately in a lot of developing countries, including ours, um, is not routinely done. And therefore, we have late presentation and a late diagnosis leaving, uh, leading to complications and treatment that's delayed. Uh, I'm presenting this case to demonstrate the destructive effects of delayed diagnosis of PUJO. On your left, you see um, and a prenatal ultrasound of uh, the kidneys showing hydronephrosis, which is one of uh, the key presentations in diagnosing uh, PUJO. We also are going to highlight the importance of BP check in child children, as well as renal ultrasound with doctor as an initial investigation modality for those patients presenting, pediatric patients presenting with hypertension. So my case is an 11-year-old male who presented in a hypertensive crisis with a recurrent headaches since the age of five. Um, he had no UTI or unexplained fevers, hematuria or abdominal pain. However, he had no prenatal ultrasonography done. He also had a uh, mild AKI, a uh, urine dipstick, which was significant for 2 plus protein, renal and aldosterone were done. However, unfortunately, we lost the samples. Um, and he had normal 24 alpha catecholamines in the urine. Uh, ECG and echo were um, done, which showed a uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, initial KUB at his local facility showed small hydronephrotic left kidney. Um, at this point, they referred him privately for a CT, which showed a growth hy gross hydronephrosis of the left kidney, which was also atrophied and non-functional with the calculus in the proximal urethra. Here I can show you the right kidney, which is normal in size. We see the calculus here and a really um, a small amount of real um, tissue right over here, um, basically the atrophy of the kidney. Um, initially, the child was managed surgically by removal of the calculus, and they did place a double J stunt to uh, relieve that obstruction. The child was then discharged, expected to have had normalized BPs, um, and at which point they did want to do an nephrectomy. However, they lost follow-up with the child. Now the child presented to us in the Princess Marina Hospital a few months later with hypertensive crisis and a severe hypertension and um, facial palsy as well, which required four antihypertensives to manage. At this point, we did an MRA, 
owing to the fact that the CT that showed a normal kidney size was a concern for vascular disease, um, given the fact that one of the kidneys had atrophied and therefore we expected hypertrophy on the other, which was not present. So therefore we went ahead and did an MRA. The MRA also showed a normal uh, right kidney. Uh, the left kidney was not really visualized and we had um, a persistent hydronephrosis here. Um, the MRA also showed some irregularities, a narrowing of the superior inferior mesenteric arteries. Um, and this was again a concern for vascular disease, which for, for which we then went ahead and did a cardiac cath, uh, which showed normal abdominal aorta and its branches. And he, it did show no flow into the left renal artery. We also did a MAG3, which showed a zero function on the left kidney. However, the right kidney had normal uptake and drainage and a, a quite a important uh, normal graph as well. So here again, you don't see any flow on the left side of the renal artery. Um, so here I wanted to talk about the importance of PUJO and antenatal ultrasound. Uh, this is basically important as an indication for early intervention and prevent long-term complications associated with it. Because um, once again, here, after all these investigations, we went ahead into the left uh, nephroureterectomy, uh, which showed um, pathological findings showed quite um, remarkable nephrosclerosis and um, atrophy of the renal parenchyma complication that is not very much seen with PUJO to the extent at which we saw in this patient. And therefore, um, antenatal screening of, uh, of um, you know, possible obstructions um, in, in, in fetuses or in children is, is off utmost importance to prevent long long-term complications um, as this could have gone either this could have been a much worse prognosis or much worse outcome than it was um, initially that we unfortunately fortunately were lucky to to have um, so in terms of the hypertension um, two-thirds of the hypertensive cases um, are due to a renal cause and therefore a real ultrasonography with the Doppler should be one of the part of the evaluation of a kid who presents with hypertension. Uh, BP should also be measured annually for any child who's above the age of three um, and growing normally and any child who has any risk factors such as hypertension or any underlying diseases, this um, child should have BP monitoring every um, time they visit the healthcare professional. So now what is feasible in our resource limited country? Um, we, when we don't have access to CT or MRI or MAG3 to begin with, we do have access to KUBs and Dopplers and ultrasounds. What we can do is conduct serial ultrasound screening and therefore uh, note the discrepancies in the size of the kidneys uh, within the coming months of post-delivery of a child. Um, and if that is significant or, or if there's something that we notice there, this child should be timely referred, referred to a facility that can then perform a CT and do an intervention much earlier on, preventing all the complications that can be associated um, with hypertension and with the, the kind of uh, nephrosclerosis and damage that we see in the kidneys. So basically my, my message would be to do ultrasound screening regularly, do a timely referral and have access to these facilities that, um, that are available. Thank you so much. Excellent case. We will now proceed back to Tanzania we have a case called the difficult coughing infant. This was submitted by Dr. Dr. Rachel Kahuna and will be presented by Dr. Aika Shu. They are from Muhimbili National Hospital. Admitted at a pediatric intensive care unit at Muhimbili National Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It's a history of a six month old East African infant who was delivered at term by cesarean section after an eventful triple pregnancy with a birth weight of 3.1 kgs and had a good APCA score. He presented a history of recurrent cough, which started from the very early days of his life, observed immediately while breastfeeding or after breastfeeding, sometimes accompanied with choking. The cough was dry initially, later on progressed to becoming wet accompanied with fast breathing, sometimes with wheezing, sometimes there was no wheezing. From one month of age, he started developing fevers. There were low to high breath, intermittent, and uh, there was no history of uh, loss of consciousness or conversions. His parents sought help in several hospitals, 
and it was treated as a case of pneumonia, given several causes of antibiotics, including amoxicillin, septriaxone. However, there's no improvement of symptoms. So due to this recurrent illness, it further led to poor weight gain. And at five months of age, a nasogastric tube was inserted, hoping that cough and deep cutting breath will improve. However, there is no improvement of symptoms. That further led to refer this refer of this child to our unit. So on uh, examination on the day of admission, he was lethargic in severe respiratory distress. His respiratory system findings were he was very tachypneic. His respiratory rate was more than 60 breaths per minute, saturating between 85 to 88 oxygen on room air. He had intercostal recession, lower chest wall in drawing, asymmetrical chest expansion. And when we ascultated his lungs, he, we had more crackles on the left compared to the right side. His heart findings, he had normal heart sounds, there was no murmur, and the rest of his systemic examination was unremarkable. So initially we did several investigations. We did a full blood picture, which found that the HP was ranging between seven and nine gram per deciliter, which was moderate to moderate microcytic hypochromic anemia, he had leukocytosis, with predominance of back, uh, neutrophils. And then we thought maybe we are dealing with most probably it's a bacterial origin, he had normal platelet count. His blood chemistry panel was normal, which included, um, we did the serum, creatinine, urea, LT, they're all within normal range. But he had elevated serum reactive protein, which is a mark of inflammation which was elevated throughout his uh, very early days of admission in our ICU. Then we thought maybe this child is presenting with one of the congenital acquired infections, which so we screened for torches, which included toxo, cytomegalovirus, rubella, they're all negative, and even HIV was negative. We then thought maybe we're dealing with uh, one of the congenital heart, lung, heart malformations, and then we did an echo, which showed that he had the normal heart structure. So we did a chest X-ray. When we did a chest X-ray, his very chest X-ray showed that there was a diffuse cystic changes in the left lung with consolidation in the right lung. Then we thought most probably um, it's a congenital cystic lung malformation. And then that further triggered us to do a chest CT scan. And when we did a chest CT scan uh, in the coronal minimal intensity, we found there was a communication between the distal left main bronchus and the esophagus. And then when we did a volume rendered reformat, it showed better there was that fistula struck as projected by the arrow and there was consolidation of the right lung and extensive cystic changes of the right of the left lung. So we came up with a diagnosis of bronchiosophageal fistula involving the left main distal bronchus with a distal esophagus with associated ipsilateral cystic changes and a diagnosis of severe pneumonia. So he was admitted, kept on several causes of antibiotics, including carefreaxone and meropenem, and he underwent left immunectomy, whereby we found there was a fibrotic lung with past pockets as projected from the pictures. And um, after the operation, the child was kept on ventilatory support. And uh, on the day four, post-op, he had uh, fistula dehiscence and he was sent back for reclosure. So the post-op x-ray, it showed there was a left pneumonectomy and uh, consolidation of the right lung with prominent bowel loops. So it came up with the diagnosis of bronchiosophageal fistula. This bronchiosophageal fistula, you know, it can be congenital acquired. Acquired cases like a, child, like a person presenting with TB, but congenital like a case for a child. And why did we decide to present this case? Because it's one of the very rare cases. It is less common than tracheosophageal fistula by 20 to 50%. Its symptoms can start as early as in during neonatal period or as late as during adult period. 
It has been classified into four types, where type 1 to type 4 is isolated fistula with a normal lung, while in type 4, it's connected to a sequestered lung as a case of our dear infant. And so this brings us to the end of our presentation. We thank you for listening. Excellent case. Just keep in mind that uh, you should select the ones that you prefer for the People's Choice Award. Now we're going to travel to Zambia, where we will talk about manganism. This is by Dr. Dixon Mukombwe, and he's from the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka. Hi, all. welcome to my Manganism case presentation to this Imaging Case Conference. I'm Dr. Dixon Mukombo, an adult neurology resident at uh, University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia. I present a 37-year-old male who presented with a mild to moderate headache for four months, as well as chest pain for three months, which was associated with intermittent cough, occasionally productive with brown sputum. He also had burning pains and pins and needles in bilateral lower limbs for the past three months as well and uh, memory lapses for the past two months with slowness in talking and cognitive decline for the past two months, as well as low volume speech and increased difficulties completing activities of daily living noted by the collateral. His past medical history was significant for pulmonary TB, which was diagnosed two months prior to presentation based on chest X-ray for which he had started on TB treatment with no improvement in symptoms. His, um, his other past medical history was otherwise unremarkable. His family history, was equally unremarkable. Social history, he worked as a manganese smelter up to the time of presentation for the past eight years and reported similar symptoms in three co-workers. He denied any smoking or alcohol intake. His exam was generally unremarkable except for neuro exam, which was noted for cognitive impairment in uh, memory and language domains with uh, decreased fluency and the monotonic uh, reduced prosody speech. However, he didn't have any aphasia. His cranial nerves were normal. His motor exam showed normal bowel tone and power was 5 out of 5 on MRC scale, except for some subtle left upper limb weakness. He had a hyperkinetic intention tremor of the tongue and the upper limbs. He had no rest tremor and he had uh, marked bradykinesia with decrement on fingertip. He had two plus reflexes in all limbs with done going planters bilaterally. He had uh, positive uh, primitive reflexes as well as a positive clapping and applause sign. The sensory exam was remarkable for a stocking and glove reduction in temperature, touch, pain, as well as vibration and proprioception in bilateral lower limbs and upper limbs. His coordination was normal with no dyspetria. He had a cockwalk gait with uh, unstableness and mild wobbling on tandem gait. Our differential diagnosis was acquired Parkinsonism secondary to manganism, as well as a typical Parkinsonism, thinking of a progressive supraniptia palsy or cortical basal degeneration. And CNS TB was entertained, given our setting where TB is highly prevalent. For waking him up, we ordered an MRI brain with and without contrast. Images will be shared. His chest X-ray, which was normal, polyneuropathy wake up, which was unremarkable except for a borderline uh, glycated hemoglobin at 6%. His sputum couch and TB PCR were negative for TB. Would have loved to do blood manganese and heavy metal levels. However, they were unavailable at our labs and uh, he was unable to do them out of pocket because of financial constraints. So his images showed uh, T1 hyperintensities in bilateral globus pallidum with corresponding T2 hyperintensities as well as uh, T1 hyperintensities in bilateral midbrain corresponding hyperintensities in, on T2. He had no contrast enhancement. Uh, his findings made us uh, think of manganism because uh, he did not have features suggestive of CNS TB, which was one of our differential. He did not have any meningeal enhancement or any hydrocephalus or any tuberculomas or brain infections, which would see in CNS TB. 
and he did not have uh, hypo intensities in the putamen or substantia nigra of the midbrain, as we would see in uh, idiopathic Parkinsonism or Parkinson plus syndromes. So a diagnosis of manganism was made based on the clinical history as well as compatible imaging findings. So manganese toxicity comes from inhalation mainly from environmental contaminants. Deficiency may lead to birth defects, impaired fertility, osteoporosis, and enhanced susceptibility to seizures. High exposure in infancy may actually lead to poor neurocognitive development, especially in verbal outcomes. Chronic exposure in adult leads to manganism. It is the 12th most abundant element on earth and occurs mostly in trace elements in our bodies and is essential for most metabolic processes of the body. Primary exposure is through dietary intake from those uh, listed below. In waking up a patient for manganese toxicity or manganism, would need to do blood manganese levels even though they are not the best biomarkers. MRI is very helpful and it shows T1 hypertensities of the basal ganglia, especially the globus pallidum, which may extend to the midbrain. Diagnosis is mainly based on clinical and physical exam, as well as exposure history with compatible MRI findings. It's treated with removal from exposure. Symptoms usually completely resolve within one year, one year of uh, ex removal from exposure. There are a few exceptions where symptoms progress even after 10 years of uh, stopping the exposure. Chelation therapy with EDT has been attempted with uh, equivocal findings. There's minimal response to levodopa. In our patient, we started in oncopidopa levodopa with slight improvement in psychomotor slowing and cognitive dysfunction. We advise the employers to relocate him to a location devoid of magnesium exposure. Metal film fever symptoms which were ascribed to TB resolved on follow-up visit after being in a manganese devoid area for three months. Thank you very much for your attention. Tolumba Twakande Lako Taonga. Thank you in uh, Zambian dialects. Okay, these have all been wonderful cases. We've heard from cases from six different countries. We're going to switch a little bit now and hear a presentation by, by Dr. Herman Milliard Derbu. She's a research fellow for in in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She works here. And is, she's going to talk about a very important topic. It's called Radial, the Global Outreach Chapter. I recommend everyone listens to this because it, we're very excited about this project. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Hermon. I am a Global Outreach and Education Research Fellow here at CHOP. I am here to present about radio, the Global Outreach Chapter. So as an introduction to radio, um, radio stands for Radiology's Intelligence Adaptive Learning. Um, so this platform was uh, started in October 2017, um, led by Dr. Janet Reed and including her team, which included the Graduate School of Education. It is the first comprehensive learning management system for radiology. Um, it houses filtered knowledge around all subspecialties. It delivers a customized curriculum to the end user, uh, blends learning and teaching into the workflow, it augments in its interpretation and points of care, and has the ability to identify learning gaps and tracks or assess students during the learning process. So the Outreach Education Curriculum is a tile within uh, radio. This was packaged in July of 2022 by the uh, Global Team, which is led by Dr. Hansel Otero. And um, this, the purpose of this was to give access to teaching materials relevant for trainees outside of the US and support research and academic collaboration, as well as create a platform to exchange cases and learning points across institutions. Um, this will launch at the end of September, um, and we uh, will launch with uh, 100 users initially. After trainees are selected, uh, residents that will be participating, after they're selected, they will be sent a REDCap survey, a REDCap form um, that looks like this, which provides uh, more information um, before we give access to radio outreach tab. So um, there are four par parts in this uh, tile. The first part, um, there's about a team, about CHOP and the global team. The second is about clinical, we're, we're more in depth in that, and the research tab, and then there's a discussion board. So as you, 
So as you um, open the dashboard, this is what the radio outreach dashboard would look like. There are two tabs, the outreach discussion board and the outreach education curriculum. So as you press on the curriculum, um, this would come pop out. And um, on the right side, you can see um, there's a progress tracker and there are the three tabs that we discussed. There's about the team, the clinical, and then the research. And um, when you drop down tiles, there will uh, show um, subtitles as we um, as they appear. And then you would um, enroll in whichever uh, course, and then you can um, start. So as an example, let's look at the GI. Um, so there are eight subtitles that we saw. Um, it's are specific to pediatric uh, radiology. Um, so, on the after you enroll, um, it, will, it will prompt you to start the lesson. So this uh, this GI lesson on appendicitis and ultrasound imaging uh, will include a video, uh, a lecture. Um, and research that uh, support the video, and reading materials that, uh, that prompt the video. And there are questions and answers that follow. So there are an average of three or four questions per lesson. And at least two or three research or PDFs or reading materials that, um, that are relevant to the lesson as well. And these lectures are given by CHOP attendings um, throughout, throughout the years. And on the left, you can see different lessons, and it will tell you your progress in those lessons. So, um, the research tab will include four chapters, including introduction, um, writing a research paper, submitting, and other types of uh, writing, such as chapter writing, uh, peer reviews, are also included in these. Um, we are currently working on that, and uh, we'll be ready to launch by the end of September. The fourth uh, part is the discussion board. Um, this discussion board is on the front dashboard on the right side. So as you press the discussion board, it will pop up and have a, a, a little look like this, where um, residents will be able to uh, post images and discuss. Um, so there are three ways to post. You can either press the create post on that or on the right side of the screen, or just um, press on something to share. Um, so you have a summary, you put the additional information, and then you can drag images or files, and then you can create posts. You can also create questions, uh, which is basically has the same format, and then um, you can say create questions on the end there. So um, the Outreach tab on radio has a, has a few attractive uh, characteristics, um, not limited to only these four. So it has a uh, variable subspecialty topics with self-assessment options and introduction to research and research writing. It also has an interactive interface to share and discuss cases and personalized self-tracking options. Um, some of the limitations we expect are uh, due to the areas that we plan on um, sharing this. Um, there might be internet and power issues, and also um, uh, we might be limited to the number of users that we can share this to. 
Um, special thanks to Janet Reed and her team at Radio, um, especially Keith, uh, who has been very helpful, and Jessica Yeen, who um, is the media coordinator at CHOP, and she has um, helped out a lot of this. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Uh, please uh, reach out if you have any questions or comments on this. Thank you. Great, it's back to the cases. So we will travel all the way to Egypt now. In the meantime, I just want to say that if anyone has a question, please post it on the Q&A. We will proceed with all the cases and have some time for discussion and questions at the end. We now have Dr. Hassan al sazi talking about faciole hepatic, hepatic infestation. Dr. Ansasli is from Ain Shams University. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Hassan Al Trazli. I am a radiology resident at Ain Shams University Hospitals in Cairo, Egypt. I'll be presenting a very interesting case today titled The Jaundice Mystery. Mentored me throughout this case is Dr. Shema Abdul Sattar Muhammad, a professor of radiology at Ain Shams University. Helped us also with this case are Dr. Amr Abdul Hamid Abu Zaid and Dr. Usama Nagar, who are professors of pediatric surgery at Ain Shams University. Our case today starts with a seven-year-old boy who presented to the pediatric emergency department with abdominal pain and jaundice. The patient had been to multiple institutions before finally reaching ours. He had a pelvic abdominal ultrasound, which was done at another institute, that showed the following. Now, these images show intrahepatic periradical dilatation, CBD dilatation, common wild lug dilatation, and echogenic content inside the biliary tree. Now, this content was initially interpreted as very sludge. The patient was then underwent a CT scan of the abdomen, and axial cuts show dilated CBD and intrahepatic radical dilatation. The patient was then scheduled for an MRCP, and the MRCP showed a dilated biliary tree with multiple hypointense filling defects. At this point, the patient was initially diagnosed as a cholidocal cyst and the decision of surgery was taken. However, intraoperatively, a surprise was found. These little guys were found during the surgery. Now, can anyone take a guess to what they are? If you guessed that these are fasciola hepatica, then you are 100% correct. So, what is the final diagnosis that we have reached now to, for this case? This is a case of fasciola hepatica infestation masquerading as a cholidocal cyst in a seven-year-old child. And what was the outcome of this patient? The patient was placed on appropriate th therapy and then discharged from the hospital after improvement. Now, fasciolasis is caused by infection of trematodes be belonging to the genus fasciola, which includes fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. Worldwide, numerous cases have been reported, especially in endemic areas such as Africa and the Middle East. So, why are these places endemic? Because they are the natural habitat for the freshwater snails, which act as an intermediate host for this trematode. Fasciola hepatica may infest all domestic animals, but chronically, infected sheep are the most important source of contamination. But how do humans get infected? Humans get infected by ingestion of poorly washed plants such as lettuce, mint, and parsley, where the metacercaria complete their life cycle. Fasciola hepatica infection can cause a wide variety of clinical manifestations such as cholecystitis, cholangitis, liver abscesses, and even liver fibrosis. Patients usually present with right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain, jaundice, or pruritus. Treatment of fasciolases includes triclabendazole, which is a drug of choice. And then, if complicated by secondary bacterial cholangitis, then the appropriate antibiotic therapy should be prescribed. Surgery, if failed the ARCP for cases that cause obstruction. So, what is our take-home message for here today? Our take-home message is that fasciola hepatica should be considered as a differential diagnosis in patients presenting with obstructive jaundice, especially, especially in endemic areas. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this case. Thank you very much. Now we're back to Tanzania. 
Dr. Pedro Palangio is going to share his case on spontaneous subdural empiema. Great pleasure. Greetings from Tanzania. My name is uh, Pedro Palangio. I'm a medical doctor working with Jakaya Kikwete Cardiac Institute, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It is with great pleasure that I'm presenting an interesting case of spontaneous subdural empyema following high parasitemia falciparum malaria. Malaria continues to devastate impoverished societies across the globe. Sub-Saharan Africa, in which Tanzania is one of the countries, uh, harbors over 90% of all malaria cases and fatalities, according to the WHO data of 2021. With this fact, this particular region remains the hardest hit region uh, across the globe. Malaria has numerous complications. Some of them are deadly. And subdural empyema, which refers to a collection of pus between the dura and arachnoid matter, is one of the unusual but highly fatal complications of falciparum malaria. We received a 58-year-old woman with an eight-year history of hypertension uh, with poor adherence and subsequent poor blood pressure control. She was diagnosed with severe form of malaria. Results of the blood slide for malaria parasite revealed over a thousand malaria parasites in 200 white blood cells. And the sequestered red blood cells contained the mature forms of the parasites that includes trophozoids, and merons. She was put on the local protocol for management of severe malaria. However, despite all the efforts, the patient continued to deteriorate, particularly in the higher centers. On admission to our center, she was febrile with a temperature of about 39.2 degrees Celsius and a Glasgow coma scale of 9 over 15. She had elevated blood pressure, reduced urinary output, elevated urea and creatinine, and deranged liver enzymes. Moreover, full blood count revealed neutrophilia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Management of severe malaria was reinstated with IV uh, artesunate. She received three units of platelet concentrate and her antihypertensives were optimized. Based on the reduced renal functions, she underwent five sessions of hemodialysis. However, despite all these efforts, her altered mentation did not improve. At this juncture, we employed radiological techniques to assess for the brain and see what actually is happening up there. So this particular figure is showing the MRI, both T1 weighted and T2 weighted films, which actually revealed a bilaterally thin but widely spread subdural collection in the frontal parieto region as depicted by the white arrows. This particular image, which is T1 plus C weighted film, displayed similar features of bilaterally thin but widely spread subdural collection in the frontal parietal region with peripheral meningeal enhancement as well as leptomeningeal enhancement. Based on these radiological findings, this particular patient underwent a frontotemporal osteoplastic flap craniotomy, which revealed thick pus. However, analysis of this purulent fluid revealed pus cells without any organisms. 
Following this procedure, this patient improved dramatically and was discharged after 21 days of hospitalization. So we knew this was malaria. We were certain it was a severe form of malaria, but without the radiological techniques, we could have easily lost this patient, but thanks to the radiological techniques, because we managed to diagnose or to identify an unusual complication of malaria, and this patient was managed timely and promptly, and that patient is alive until to date. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless you all. It was a great case. Now we're going to proceed to Nigeria. We're going to have cranial electricity. So we'll, excuse me, we're going to go to Ethiopia now with Dr. Lensa Million and massive enterolithiasis. Good morning, everyone. My name is Million. I'm a third year radiology resident at the Grand Besa Hospital in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and I have no disclosures. And today I'm going to pre to present you a case of massive enterolithiasis. Uh, and she was a uh, she's a 52 years old female patient uh, presented with abdominal pain of two months duration, and she lives in remote rural area of Ethiopia, and she has no history of psychiatric illness and she was investigated with abdominal pelvic CT scan and here we have the scout image and on this scout image what we can see is there are multiple intra-abdominal radiolucent uh, rims which have uh, internal radiolucent core and uh, it's almost filled uh, the whole abdomen and uh, uh, we have post contrast abdominal pelvic CT and uh, here we have here the reconstructed coronal image and we have the reconstructed sagittal image and we have the axial image and on this reconstructed coronal image what we can see is the large ball is distended we can see the ascending colon the transverse colon and the descending colon they are distended and they are filled with this radio uh, radio opaque rims which have internal radio lucent core and um, we can see on this image the the small bowel loops they are not distinct there is no sign of obstruction and we can see uh, the reconstructed on the, the sagittal image we can see the ascending colon is significantly distended and it's filled with this uh, radio dense stones and uh, we can see on this also uh, reconstructed coronal image we can see the transverse colon is significantly distended and they are filled with this multiple different sized zones and it has also massive effect resulting in the transverse colon it's pulled down into the pelvis and we can also see that there is forward thickening likely this is due to the pressure effect resulting in bowel edema and we can clearly appreciate the density of the stones on this bone window reconstructed um, coronal image we can see the density of the bones is almost similar to the the, the the stone is almost similar to the stone so we have extensive different size the stones in the large bone uh, with uh, associated bowel edema and also we can uh, see on this 3d image we can clearly appreciate the stones and uh, we can see the transverse colon it's uh, filled with this multiple different size stones and it looks like a sack uh, full of stone so to say something about interolithesis it's a formation of dense concentrations or interolysis in the gastrointestinal tract and the reported prevalence is around 0.3 to 10 percent and the most common they are as a result of uh, in underlying intestinal pathologies which results in intestinal stasis and uh, they can be secondary to communicating uh, ileal duplication cysts, incarcerated inguinal hernia they can be structure of many causes like Crohn's diseases tuberculosis and radiation enteritis and the clinical manifestation, they can present with 
acute or subacute intestinal obstruction, which we don't have in our patient. And the treatment is interleaser removal and correction of the underlying pathology. And the outcome in our patient, uh, she was managed conservatively because there was no sign of complete obstruction. And on follow-up, the patient started to pass the stones and the stone analysis was done and it's revealed a calcium stone. So uh, in summary, this is a, a very uncommon presentation of colonic enterolithiasis. So this is a very massive enterolithiasis and the patient's septum was not as dramatic as the imaging finding. So this was a case of massive enterolithiasis. So thank you for your attention. Now we will present our second case from Nigeria, Dr. Promise Jaja, with cranial electrical burn injury with neurological sequelae. A neurosurgery resident with the University College of Ibado, Nigeria, I will be presenting a rare electrical bone presentation titled Cranial Entry Electrical Bone Injury with Neurological Sequelae. A case report at a year post injury. We have no conflicts to disclose. It is known that electrical bonds are usually disputed injury as electricity tracks through good conductors like arteries and nerves to deeper, poor conducting, high resistance tissues, generating heat alongside other injuries. The rest of the case will be discussed using this outline. Our patient was a 16 year old right hand dominant male who presented two hours post electrical bonds. Sustained following attempts at turning off the mains at home, he was immediately thrown to an energized wrought iron burglary proof. He was rescued within two minutes with a wooden staff and sustained transient loss of consciousness that was fully regained within 30 minutes. There were no other systemic injuries. He was immediately rushed for care. He was the first of five children to parents and live in the rural fringes of Ibadan, Nigeria. His admitting GCS was at least nine. He had marked craniofacial edema with bilateral periorbital edema. He had a defective mini mental state examination. There were no cranial nerve, long tract, nor cerebellar deficits. He had charred and necrotic mid frontoparietal scalp with exposed the new dead parietal calvarium. He sustained full thickness bone injuries to the right fingers, thigh, and toes. He had exit wounds in the right thumb, thigh, and toes. The other systemic examinations were found to be normal. This image shows the exposed calvarium as well as at this point. The diagnosis of 9% total body surface area electrical bone injury, mainly full thickness, was made with gangrenous mid frontoparietal scalp and underlying calvarium. He had electrocardiogram done that was normal as well as serum electrolyte urine creatinine that were within normal limits. Neuroimaging done a day post injuries showed diffuse brain swelling with left frontal intracerebral hyperdensities separated by thin rims of iso densities, suggestive of hematoma. There were attenuation of the cerebrospinal fluid channels as evidenced by attenuation of the lateral ventricles bilaterally. He had a left ward midline sheet less than two millimeters in the region of the hematoma. He was resuscitated using the standard bone unit protocol. He had Debrimon of the child in the scalvarium with outer strip corticectomy covered with split thickness skin graft. He sustained an untable cardiac arrest. On the 17th day post born, he had an inner strip corticectomy with bilateral posterior auricular artery based flap covers. He also had an untable cardiac arrest from primary hemorrhage. On the 27th day post born, he had split thickness skin cover of the residual scalp defects with tangential bone wound excisions and split thickness skin graft as well as luva flap covers. He developed right upper eyelid contractures, on account of which he had a right upper eyelid contracture release and tassography on the 50th day post bone. He was discharged home on the 73rd day post bone. This image shows the residual scalp defect that was subsequently covered with the skin, split thickness skin graft. Four months post bone, he showed post traumatic seizures on account of which he was commenced on anti-epileptic drugs. Calvarial reconstruction was deferred due to unavailability of the calvarial prosthesis. At the year post bone, he had these images showing satisfactory healing of the facial injuries as well as the split thickness skin grafts. The prevalence of electrical bones from bone center analysis showed um, 
increased preponderance in developing countries accounting for 21 to 27%. Whereas in developed countries, the prevalence was 0.04 to 5%. The severity is grossly underestimated using the standard bond unit estimations. Cranial entry is indeed a very rare type and requires scalp and calvarial reconstruction. The associated injuries were loss of consciousness in our 70. 0.5% of patients, cardiac injuries in about 51% of patients, and brain trauma in 2.3% of patients. The pathologies usually come from electrical, thermal, vascular, as well as neurohumoral mediator related damages. Electrocardiographic abnormalities are found in only about 4% of patients, even though the commonest cause of death is cardiac, with ventricular arrhythmias and asystole being the commonest associations. The cardiac damages are usually from electric and thermal cardiomyocyte damage. Electrocution post-mortem analysis showed widespread myocardial focal necrosis in many of the patients. These central nervous system effects usually are from confusion, loss of consciousness, amnesia, and seizures. This patient most likely had a central cerebral syndrome accounting for the acute and chronic neurologic sequelae. Thermal and vascular-related images were the suggested causes here. The lessons learned here include the fact that electrical bone is a rare type of injury, and that despite low abnormal ECG risk, cardiac damage is still common. This, patient, this feature is usually, this problem is usually image modifying and psychological occupational therapy is usually necessary. Thank you. These are our references. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go to Kenya. Dr. Ndaro Daniel is going to present his case on pediatric brain injury. Hello there. My name is Ndaro Daniel. I'm a neurosurgery resident at Tenwek Mission Hospital, which is in Bomet, Kenya. My mentors are Drs. Hatang, Anderson, and uh, Copeland. Hello there. My name is Ndaro Daniel. I'm a neurosurgery resident at Tenwek Mission Hospital, which is in Bomet, Kenya. My mentors are Drs. Hatang, Anderson, and uh, Copeland. So I'm going to present uh, on pediatric traumatic brain injury, focusing on the surgical and medical management following a delayed presentation of a penetrating tree branch. I have no disclosures to make. So the Tenwek Mission Hospital is located to the southwest of the country, serving a peasant agrarian population of about, with about 400 uh, bed capacity. Uh, injury after fall from a tree is not uncommon in rural Africa, but typically presents with axial or appendicular fracture or injury. Delayed presentation uh, to Kenyan referral hospital is common. This case emphasizes the value of neurosur uh, neurosurgical expertise in providing adequate surgical and medical management of this complex and unusual injury. So we had a nine-year-old boy who presented with a mild neck stiffness, headache, mild photophobia, and fever for one week. And uh, he reports to have fallen from a tree landing on a sharp piece of wood one week previously. He also presented with CSA frenorrhea, and we did a CT scan with and without contrast. Um, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the mixed uh, densities uh, revealing the front body, uh, revealing uh, some bone chips, and also uh, involvement of the left uh, uh, frontal lobe. Um, as far as the um, surgical CT scan, you realize that uh, the, uh, the trajectory of the front body is clearly peaked, uh, and you can also see the involvement of the uh, anterior skull base, uh, as it's shown by the yellow arrows. So uh, this uh, coronal view gives us a better understanding of the, the injury uh, with the involvement of the medial uh, wall of the, uh, the left uh, orbit. So uh, the bony window uh, just gives us a still better understanding of the involvement of the uh, sinus, the sinus injury that uh, he had, and also uh, the uh, fracture through the uh, anterior skull base. And also this uh, coronal view gives us the, uh, a better view of the trajectory uh, with the uh, fractures there in. Um, so this gives us a summary of what we had, uh, looking at the same uh, lesion with mixed uh, densities, 
looking at the trajectory right there and uh, the involvement, realized that it, uh, the front body went through the nasal cavity uh, into the uh, involving part of the medial wall of the left frontal, uh, rather the left uh, orbit. Uh, then also uh, part, uh, it went through the cribriform plate into the, uh, into the anterior cranial uh, fossa. So it was studied on IV broad spectrum antibiotics and taken to the operating room. We performed a transnasal endoscopic extraction of the front body with autologous uh, duroplasty. And uh, looking at the pathology, uh, radiology correlation of the same, uh, looking at the, you can see the orientation of fibers on the front body inside what we have on the CT scan. And uh, another important point here is that um, it's, it's easy to confuse uh, uh, the consistency of, of uh, wood uh, for air uh, or the other way around in the case of a, a, a CT scan, because they have the same uh, density. Um, yeah, so that's an important point to, uh, to note uh, when interpreting such images. Uh, the patient had an improving post-operative course for the first few days, but headaches returned. A repeat uh, head CT scan with contrast was performed, and uh, I realized that we see these um, ring-enhancing lesion with mixed uh, uh, densities and uh, with a bony uh, fragment on your left, uh, or the left image. And, um, and that is being a uh, post-operative day 10. And uh, these uh, coronal views uh, uh, show us the, uh, that this lesion was actually by uh, You can see the mixed densities with a, a mass uh, effect on the uh, faults right there on the image on the right. So uh, at presentation, this is what we had. And then uh, post-op day 10, that despite removing the uh, uh, foreign body, we still had formation of an abscess uh, 10 days later, which was quite massive. And it had to be taken in uh, to the OR for uh, by frontal craniotomy with drainage over the abscess and uh, repeated uh, repeat uh, duroplasty. He completed a six week course, six weeks course of uh, of a six week course of uh, inter in as a broad spectrum antibiotics and a repeat scan revealed a benign post inflammatory changes without a recurrent abscess. So uh, six days out, um, this is what we had. And McHugh, this boy was uh, discharged in a stable condition. He didn't have any uh, focal deficits. Uh, he did well, which is, was a success story. So pediatric injury as a result of injury from a tree is not uncommon in rural Africa. However, the injury is usually as on an extremities or on the pelvis, uh, or, or pelvic fractures rather. And uh, penetrating traumatic brain injuries are quite uncommon and unexpected. And we had to take time to explain to the mother and convince her that uh, indeed the son had this injury. And uh, we took them in and did the surgeries, but then they also had financial uh, constraints and uh, they had to benefit from compassionate uh, fund, which is another uh, uh, setback in our setup. So in this case, uh, direct inoculation of a contaminated foreign body, such as wooden debris, led, uh, led to delayed formation of an abscess, despite prophylactic um, antibiotic therapy and removal of most of the wood fragment. And uh, you can see the same correlation on that image right there. And um, so wood is known to have a myriad of microorganisms due to its porosity. And uh, so in conclusion, uh, penetrating, uh, penetrating traumatic brain injury from wood is an uncommon complication from fall from a tree with challenging management in this case due to delayed presentation and abscess formation after surgical intervention. There is value in exploring appropriate antibiotic regimen uh, in uh, penetrating a traumatic brain injury, especially in rare cases such as wood penetration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, excellent case. Now we're going to move to Dr. Macrina Comba from Tanzania. This case. So, Dr. Macrina Comba will present a case on Takayasu arteritis presenting with convulsive syncope. Um, yaka. Greetings. My name is uh, Macrina Comba. I'm from Yakaya Kikwete Cardiac Institute, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I'm going to present for you an interesting case of Takayasu arteritis, which was mistaken for epilepsy. Takayasu arteritis is occlusive thrombotopathy in which is common worldwide. And different studies were done and showed that Takayasu arteritis 
present as heart failure, anuria, finger clubbing, stroke, boy gangrene, and blindness. Symptomatology of Takarasu arthritis is heterogeneous, and only 10% are asymptomatic. And the, the, the sufferance of this, of this disease is also good. Takarasu arthritis uh, have different manifestation in CNS, but syncope is rare. So I'm going to present for you a 17 years old male with a known past medical history who was referred to our setup with the diagnosis of epilepsy. He had 28 weeks of history of recurrent conversion, which was tonic chronic syncope attack of one to third times per day, and followed by loss of consciousness of 10 to 30 minutes. He had no blood incontinence or aura sign. He also denied the history of meningitis. On the examination, he had weak branch and radio pulse, left carotid and the vertebral bruise were noted. He had elevated blood pressure on the left side and normal on the right side. His pulse rate was 119 beat per minute, regular and in good volume. Per abdomen, there were no evidence of grits or aneurysm. In lab and images, he had ele elevated of inflammatory mark. Tuberculin test was negative. Echo findings were normal, except for aortic regurgitation. He also done carotid Doppler ultrasound, which shows complete oblution of the left common internal and external carotid arteries. CT of the brain and ECG were normal. So the first image showed the CT of the thoracic and abdominal aorta, in which displays the left common carotid artery, left sub, and the origin of the subcravian artery, which are irregular narrowing with variable degrees of stenosis, tapering, and coagulated, which are the features suggestive for arteritis. And the second image shows the MR of the brain, in which there is total cushion of the left common carotid left internal and left external carotid and left vertebral arteries. So the left image shows the normal MR of the brain. So due to history, examination and images, we came up with the conclusion of the diagnosis of Takahashi arthritis in which we managed the patient with dexamethasone, methotrate, uniaspirin and amylodipine. And 60 days before the patient started using steroid, he got 14 conversion syncope and five episodes after the uh, during the last seven days. And to make follow up for the patient on the third and the sixth month, and his blood pressure was normal and he had no seizures. So I can conclude by saying that this patient with Takahashi arthritis vary in a greater in their clinical presentation. So for one to come up with this diagnosis should have a detailed history and physical examination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Now we're going to have a live presentation from Dr. Farouk Dako. You already have heard him speak, but he's an assistant professor of radiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He will be giving a live presentation. All right, I just want to share really quickly some exciting um, adventure that we're starting over at um, at um, in, uh, Penn and my department. Um, but we, we're starting, uh, or we've already started uh, Radiology Center for Global and Population Health Research. So this is, this is um, a research lab that's, again, focused on global and 
population health and the role um, radiology can play. Uh, this is the vision as to utilize imaging and non-imaging data to reduce global burden of diseases through equitable evidence-based approaches and support digital transformation of healthcare in low resource settings. But we have a lot of alliances um, that I'm, I've listed here. Um, I'm not gonna go um, over every one of this, but um, these are different groups that are led by um, some colleagues that I, I, I appreciate a lot and some of the groups that I'm also a part of. So far, the personnel are myself um, and James Gee, who is a mentor, uh, PhD, and he he has a couple labs as well, and he um, we 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 share a, a similar um, um, uh, history in that we were both born in, in in Nigeria. You know, I I left college, but he left after a couple of years um, um, of age. So these are these are some of the the funded projects that we have that I serve as the PI. Um, we have a lung cancer surveillance system um, grant um, supported by GRAF. Uh, recently got uh, another grant from Bristol Myers Squibb, looking at how to increase equitable adherence to lung cancer screening. We have another project supported by an internal grant, um, um, looking into the analysis of CT thorax utilization for COVID. And there are a lot of affiliated grant projects as well that I'm personally a, a part of that um, members of this center can also participate in. Um, uh, this is one uh, called the Data Lake for Health Equity. It's a grant that was awarded to Eradate that I serve as a co-PI. Um, this is another um, project supported by Lacuna, led by uh, my colleague, Udona, as well as the Consortium for MRI Education and Research in Africa, which is supported by uh, CZI and um, led by um, Dr. Ogbole um, as a PI. And this is an uh, uh, NCI um, project that I, I serve on as a consultant as well. Um, it's a center in my institution for research to optimize precision lung cancer screening in diverse populations. So these are some plans for the academic year. And this is really why I'm presenting it here, just as an opportunity. Um, we have um, funds to hire one full-time postdoc um, slash data scientist. So this can be a PhD or an MD, somebody who really wants to focus you know, um, on research as a career. Uh, we also have funds that hire one full-time research assistant. So, so again, this could be a, a physician who maybe wants to spend a couple years in research before going back into clinical work. We also obviously have space for part-time volunteer research assistants. Some of the other plans we have are to improve the website. Right now, if you if you Google Center for Global and Population Health um, and Radiology on Penn, you will see a website, but there isn't much information there. We're also trying to do um, create a few strategic alignments and collaborations, and we, we want to launch one new global health research project. Okay. So these are just some papers that I, I just, you know, that you know have been published recently, just to give you an idea of the sort of projects you can be involved in. This is a paper that we published in um, Radiology AI recently, again, led by uh, my colleague, uh, Udona uh, Anazoto, right, uh, describing the, um, an Africa Neuroimaging Archive, which is a project that, that she leads. Um, this is a paper that we have, that we, um, that we worked on together. Um, a lot of us um, who do work in Africa, uh, including Frank, um, are, are a part of this um, project. This is a paper that's been accepted. Uh, this is a paper that was accepted into Nature Communications uh, yesterday um, using federated learning uh, to enable big data for rate cancer boundary detection. Again, this is a collaboration between basically every continent, um, multiple hospitals, over 100 authors. And, you know, my role here was to help with the data um, sourcing from, from and processing from um, Africa in collaboration with, again, uh, colleagues in Nigeria. This is a review article that I wrote with Hansel and some other folks in the room as well, Monica. Um, again, just to give you give you an idea of, of the projects that we're you know we're going to be working on in this lab. So a lot of global health work, some original research, a lot of stuff around uh, data science, some artificial intelligence, and some community health work. So and, and you know I'm 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 here today just because I I want folks to um, reach out. Like I said, we're looking for personnel um, to hire, and we're looking for people to to work with. And you know, as Frank says, you know, these efforts um, need a village. Um, so please reach out to me. This is my email, and this is my Twitter handle. I'm also here in the panel for for a little while. So feel free to um you know to to message me.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, this was a really interesting presentation about these efforts that are happening in collaboration with different countries. We're ready to go back to the last block of cases before our voting and final decisions are made. So the first case of this block is going to be from Liberia. Dr. Kebede Gopher will present the case on soft tissue ossification. opportunity to present extremely hello everyone this is dr kapere gofer from uh, john f kennedy hospital monrovia liberia and i'm so glad to get this opportunity to present extremely unusual case of disabling soft tissue ossification and then i don't have any uh, disclosure so my case is a 10 years old girl with three years of worsening posterior and anterior chest wall swelling and deformity. Uh, she has progressive inability to use her upper extremities for the last 16 months. She doesn't have any family history of similar illness. She has five siblings who are healthy. She is on Doricoxib 90 milligram daily dose since January, uh, after which she has some improvement in soft tissue swelling and pain. And, uh, on physical exam, the image on the left side of the screen is taken in April 2021, and she has uh, this massive swelling, uh, hard swelling in upper thorax, bilateral uh, and scapular regions, and uh, lumbar area. And uh, the image on the right side of the screen is taken last week, and she, the soft tissue swelling uh, and, and duration has a little bit subsided. Uh, on other part of the physical examination and the range of movement in the shoulder joint is significantly reduced, especially the abduction is reduced to less than 10 degrees on the right side and to less than 30 degrees on the left side. And uh, on musculoskeletal exam, she has bilaterally short uh, thumb and most importantly, she has short great toe with hallux deformity. Uh, her laboratory test are in the normal range, total calcium is normal, and phosphorus is normal. We didn't do genetic and chromosomal tests because the test is not available. On uh, imaging, uh, volume reconstructed CT uh, has demonstrated this massive dystrophic uh, dips of tissue ossifications, which extend from uh, cervical area to the lumbar region, and on the lateral chest wall, extending to bilateral humeri, forming pseudo articulations. On, uh, Anterior chest, she has branching dips of tissue ossifications, or which tend to follow the uh, the insertion sites of the pectoralis major muscle. On axial bone window, she has uh, uh, classically ossified bone in dips of tissue, which uh, looks to have which looks to have the normal architecture of the bone, having the cortex and the medulla, both articulating uh, with humeri. Uh, and uh, both articulating with uh, dips of tissue ossifications, which has attachment to the to bilateral humeri. And uh, on magnified view, you can clearly see the uh, ossified parts of dystrophic calcification has continuity with the humerus and uh, with the medullary cavity. And on uh, C spine, she has fused bilateral facet joints of C3, C4, C6, and C7. And the pedicle of the C3 is broader and it has uh, ground glass internal matrix. On pelvic scan, <coughs> she has she has short, broad femoral necks. On summary, this is 10 years old child with progressive soft tissue swelling, uh, ossification, and uh, uh, significantly restricted range of movement. And she has bilaterally short great toe with hallux valgus deformity, short thumbs diffuse uh, deep soft tissue ossifications, fused facet joints in cis point, short broad uh, femoral mix, and she doesn't have family history. With this, all clinical findings and imaging findings, my top differential diagnosis is fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, and uh, its previous name is called myositis ossificans progressiva or Stoneman's disease. The prevalence is one in two million. 
most are sporadic and uh, some have uh, genetic uh, inheritance which is in autosomally dominant matter and the cause is mutation in activin uh, receptor one or activin like kinase uh, receptor 2 gene, which encodes active in A receptor type 1 and active in like kinase 2, a bone morphogenetic protein type 1 receptor. Uh, so the mutation of this gene will result in uh, abnormal morphogenesis of the deep conductive tissues into, into the bone. So uh, the diagnosis is more clinical and, uh, uh, it's, and then it's confirmed by molecular genetics. Clinically, uh, patients will come with congenital malformations of the growth toes. Uh, this is seen in 100%, and they will come with, uh, then in the first decade of their life, they will come with uh, soft tissue swelling, which starts uh, usually after one and a half year, and that soft tissue swelling will progressively ossify uh, with progressive heterotopic ossifications in distinct anatomical pattern. So most patients, like around 75% uh, of patients will have uh, soft tissue ossifications by the age of five, and uh, their range of uh, joint movement will be restricted uh, by the age of seven, and most like 97 will have very marked uh, joint restriction by the age of 15. So the confirmation is by molecular genetics. So in conclusion, our patient fulfills all clinical and imaging criteria to diagnose fibrodysplastic uh, ossificans progressiva. We don't have access to molecular and genetic confirmatory diagnostics. It's wise to consider fibrodysplastic ossificans progressiva in patients with rapidly progressive soft tissue swelling and ossifications and malformed greater And if diagnosed, if misdiagnosed, children may undergo unnecessary and harmful diagnostic procedures like injections, intramuscular injections, biopsies, and also excisions, which exacerbate the progression of the condition. So it's better to have a great uh, and high index of suspicions in, in the patient with uh, short, uh, great toe with hallux deformity and uh, soft tissue swelling in the first decade of life uh, to consider fibrodysplastic ossificans progressiva. Uh, these are my references, and thank you so much for your attention. Okay, wonderful presentation. Uh, now we're going to have our other case from Kenya. Dr. Daniel Moenga is going to present his case about large gossip pibomas related to remote surgery. Please. Greetings and thank you for the opportunity. I'm Dr. Moenga Daniel, a surgical resident at Tenok Hospital, Kenya. I present a case of an unexpected cause of abdominal and back pain, a case of three large gossip fibromas related to remote surgery. My mentors are Dr. Michael Hutton and Dr. Elizabeth Matiro. This is an aerial view of Tenok Hospital, a rural facility in Bomet, Kenya. And not so long ago, we had a 40-year-old female who presented with a nine-month history of painful abdominal swelling and back pains. Prior to this, she had a stillbirth complicated with a ruptured uterus, and she actually required emergency total abdominal hysterectomy. This was done in another facility. Uh, to further investigate her symptoms, we sent her for an abdominal pelvic CT scan with oral and intravenous contrast, starting at the top by the liver and scrolling down, we were able to see um, several intra-abdominal masses uh, with dense, swally, squiggly lines in, uh, in the masses, and the masses are actually in close association uh, with the bowel. Um, the coronal, Im coronal images reveal similar findings. That is three intra-abdominal masses. The two on the right of the abdomen are relatively well circumscribed and encapsulated. The one on the left uh, has air density and is in close association with the thickened loop of uh, jejunum. Uh, this is indicating it's probably in, uh, eroded into the jejunum. 
So from here, we can highlight the key findings. That is three abdominal masses containing dense lines uh, circle here in the axial images. And on the coronal images, we see two right uh, abdominal masses. Uh, the one on the left, in, uh, as shown by the arrows, uh, appears to communicate with the loop of jejunum, which is all actually hidden, as you can see by the arrows. Uh, one thing we can appreciate is that uh, the use of bright oral contrast has increased the confidence in evolution of these masses and their relationship to the bowel. And finally, here we highlight three masses on sagittal formatted images. Uh, and as uh, the one circle starting from the uh, left towards the right, uh, we see the masses uh, in the sagittal view. Now, the preliminary interpretation of the scan raised concern of endemic parasitic infections such as hydatid and ascariasis. Uh, and this was due to the rounded masses with the swally uh, linear densities throughout. And um, one thing, um, and as we were considering our differentials, the scout images actually played an important role. Uh, often we find that scout images are opt uh, they obtained uh, during the planning of the CT and they're usually forgotten or ignored, but sometimes can be very useful uh, as, as seen in our case. So the coronal and the sagittal scout images uh, were able to appreciate the extent and continuity of linear densities in the masses, uh, which have a pathognomic appearance that helps confirm the diagnosis. In particular, the coronal scout serves a uh, good match for the coronal uh, uh, MI, MIP images, uh, which were actually reformatted from the CT. Uh, this allowed us to see the squiggly uh, dense lines in all, in all the three masses in a single image. And this is characteristic of um, radiodense markers of coxibibomas or retained surgical sponges. Now, for surgery, um, uh, for surgery to occur, we had to do a planning. So initially, she came in really malnourished, um, and we needed uh, nutrition optimization. Um, thereafter, we went in for surgery, and we actually found. Um, uh, th the three gauzes which were able to be retrieved. One was adherent to the abdominal wall um, covered by the bowel. The second was adherent to the momentum. And the third, uh, intraluminal, was actually intraluminal uh, within the jejuna, uh, which required resection of the bowel. These are typical gross appearance of glossipibomas, uh, like the one we found in our patient. Uh, Glossipibomas form when sponges are inadvertently left in the patient's uh, abdomen during surgery. This can uh, uh, the, the, this can actually become encapsulated and result in adhesions or fistulas and sometimes delayed complications. These images actually show a world of encapsulated collection that, when you cut open, reveals surgical sponge material. Sometimes they are degraded that might be hard, that actually might be hard to recognize. A uh, patient did well. Uh, after surgery. In summary, uh, we have presented a patient with a history of complicated pregnancy, pregnancy loss with uterine rupture requiring emergency surgery uh, where several gauzes surgical sponges, sponges were left. Uh, this led to delayed complication including the formation of gossifibomas, which one of them actually fistulized into the bowel and were able to confidently diagnose using the CT scan. The patient uh, also had um, developed severe malnutrition and a result of this complication, uh, and he actually needed nutrition optimization before surgery. Uh, she underwent a successful surgery and the gossipibomas were removed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This was a great presentation. Now we're going to have another case presented from Tanzania. Dr. Hamim Rusheke is going to talk about Rakibagus parasitic twin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hamim Rosheke, a neuroradiology fellow from the Department of Radiology and Imaging, School of Medicine, Muhimbili University of Health and Early Sciences, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I am presenting to you a case titled A Rare Case of Right Pegas Parasitic Twin associated with the lipomyelomeningocele. Clinical summary. A four-month-old boy was brought to the OPD for evaluation of an extra pair of limbs. On examination, he was found to have accessory uh, limbs on the dorsal lower midline, and it was also noted to have a sacrodimple and occipital scalp swelling. 
On neurological examination, he was found to have reduced the mass of power on both lower limbs, and there was no history of urinal incontinence. And this is a photo of the same child showing uh, the accessory limbs, the sacral dimple, and the occipital swelling, which was later confirmed to be a sebaceous cyst. And on lab diagnostic test, it was found to have normal hematological and chemical profiles. And the MRI of the spine and brain was ordered. And this is sagittal T2 MRI of the spine. And this is sagittal star MRI of the spine, both showing the location of the accessor limbs being on the subcutaneous area, but also showing the myelomeningocele, which appear to herniate through a defect on the posterior neural arc. Uh, which was noted to span uh, from L3 through S1. And uh, we can see the neural placards inside the myelo meningocele. But you can also see the sub, sub, subcutaneous fat mass and the syringohydromyelia involving the distal cervical and the proximal thoracic and the distal thoracic cord, as well as the sebaceous cyst. So from imaging, we had a pre-op imaging differential diagnosis of Rick Pegas, parasitic twin, and a closed spinal dysphysism with the lipomyelomeningocele. Uh, treatment and follow-up, uh, the accessory limbs were excised at the age of two, and the myelomeningocele was also repaired at the same time. And the child was subjected to regular physiotherapy, uh, coupled with the limb support. Despite the above measures, there was no significant improvement on the lower limb weakness. And six years later, the same child presented with a progressive neurological deficit on both lower limbs. That necessitated the imaging re-evaluation of the spine and the brain. And the follow-up MRI of the brain and spine was ordered. And this is follow-up MRI six years later, showing the myelomeningocele uh, with a neural placard being seen going down all the way on the myelomeningocele, causing uh, spinal cord tethering at L1 level. But also in the follow-up MRI, we could see that there was a significant reduction in the size of the syringohydromyelia that appeared to be markedly reduced in this follow-up image. And uh, the sebaceous cyst was also seen, and the brain imaging revealed the normal findings. So after follow-up MRI, we had a definitive diagnosis of recipegas parasitic twin associated with the lipomyelomeningocele and complicated by persistent spinal cord tethering at L1 level. Case discussion, uh, parasitic twin refers to the type of conjoined twins in which tissues of, of an incomplete deformed twin, that is the parasite, is attached to and it depends upon a fully developed twin, that is the autocyte. And when this parasitic twin occurs on the spine, it is termed Rachipegas parasitic twin. Rachipegas parasitic twin is a rare finding with only a few uh, literatures being published worldwide. By 2020, only around 70 cases had been published or reported. We report this unusual case of Rachipegas parasitic twin associated with the lipomyelomeningocele with the undesirable post operative outcome of persistent lower limb neurological deficit that. This is stated the repeat MRI evaluation of the spine with the subsequent finding of persistent cord tethering at L1. Take home all learning points from this case. Imaging evaluation of parasitic twin is mandatory to establish its attachment, but also to rule out attachment to vital structures. Attachment of the spinal cord to the parasitic twin must be Attachment of the cord to the parasitic tissue must be recognized during imaging and must be released appropriately to avoid cord tethering. With the LA and the precise cord and tethering, we should anticipate good neurological outcome. Now, persistent of neurological deficit in the postoperative period should raise concern for persistent spinal cord tethering that should be looked before again. These are my references and thank you for your attention. Well, we have seen multiple really interesting cases today. We're down to our three final case presentations of the day. So just remember, we're going to present three more cases. And after that happens, we'll have an intermission in which the judges will deliberate and choose the best 
the winners for the day. Uh, during this intermission, we will all, also have a poll. And this poll will be important for you to vote on the People's Choice Award. This will be one case uh, presentation that is favored by most of the attendees. So just stay tuned for that. Next case, we're going to have Dr. Husna Mula. She's going to talk about Echinococcus triggering an anaphylactic reaction. This case is from South Africa. Hi, my name is Husna Mula. I will be presenting a case from Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital, Johannesburg, entitled Echinococcus Triggering an Acute Anaphylactic Reaction. The case is a 20-year-old male farmer from a village in the Eastern Cape who presented with acute onset retrosternal chest pain and dyspnea. He had no history of a cough, hemoptysis, or constitutional symptoms. On clinical exam, he was tachycardic, tachypneic, and hypoxic. Specific respiratory exam revealed the use of accessory muscles, bilateral diffuse squeezes, and decreased breath sounds in the right lower zone. There was a history of intermittent retrosternal pain reported to his family practitioner four months prior to this acute presentation. No chest x-ray was performed. He had regular contact with cattle, sheep, goats, and dogs on his farm. This is a PA and lateral chest x-ray of our patient. They are of good quality. We can appreciate the obvious abnormality of the large right hydropneumothorax, a cyst that occupies the right lower lung field with a water lily sign. The contralateral lung appears normal. This chest x-ray has features in keeping with a ruptured echinococcus cyst. Echinococcus granulosis is a tapeworm. Its normal life cycle involves dogs as the definitive hosts with various other animals acting as intermediate hosts. Humans are aberrant intermediate hosts and become infected by ingesting the eggs from dog feces. Post ingestion, the eggs hatch in the intestine and oncospheres are released. These migrate through the bowel and form hydatid cysts in various organs, predominantly the liver, followed by the lungs. Most cases of echinococcus are asymptomatic. When symptomatic, symptoms are often due to mass effects from the growing cysts, secondary infection of the cyst, or complications of rupture. Lung lesions present with cough, chest pain, dyspnea, and hemoptysis. The World Health Organization estimates an annual incidence of 1 million cases. Risk factors include living in a farming community, cattle rearing, ineffective veterinary care, lack of access to a definitive clean water supply, and a low socioeconomic status. The structure of the hydatid cyst is useful to help understand the radiological findings. There are three layers to the cyst. The innermost germinal layer, shown here in speckled white, that generates brood capsule and proto-scolocils into a central cavity, or the endocyst, the middle acellular laminated layer, shown here in black, created by the tapeworm, also called the exocyst. And lastly, the outermost adventitia or pericyst tissue, which is the host reaction. This patient became progressively hemodynamically unstable and was diagnosed with anaphylactic shock. He was managed supportively with supplemental oxygen, IV corticosteroids, and inotropic support and was subsequently transferred urgently for definitive treatment to a hospital that had cardiothoracic surgery. A chest and abdomen CT were done for operative planning and to exclude other intra-abdominal cysts. On CT, unruptured cysts are often appreciated as simple cysts with smooth walls of variable thickness with homogeneous internal contents. Rupture or growth of a cyst allows communication of the cyst with the airways, such as a bronchial. The structure can be contained or complete, and the type of rupture is associated with characteristic radiological signs. This patient had complete rupture of his hydatid cyst. These selected axial slices from his chest CT demonstrate a right hydropneumothorax and a large cyst in the right lower zone, 
with characteristic signs. The abdominal CT confirmed the absence of liver lesions. Taking a closer look at the images, let's break down the two radiological signs. The first is the onion peel sign. The ear seed is the gas lining between the endocyst and the pericyst that takes on the appearance of an onion peel. As more air is introduced to the parasitic membrane from the airways, the endocyst collapses. When the collapsed parasitic membrane floats on the surface, a water lily or camelot sign is appreciated. Treatment of echinococcus includes antiparasitic treatment with albendazole and surgical excision to evacuate the cyst and obliterate the cavity. Percutaneous treatment is contraindicated in lung lesions. This patient was managed supportively in an intensive care setting until surgical excision. He did well postoperatively and was subsequently discharged home. He is currently living in the rural Eastern Cape. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was a great case. We're down to two more case presentations. Next, we have Dr. Fatima Zainedin presenting on calvarial syphilitic osteomyelitis. This case is from Lebanon. Hello, everyone. My name is Fatima Zainedin, PTY3, Diagnostic Radiology Resident at Lebanese University. Today, I will present from our radiology department at Mount Lebanon Hospital a case of calvarial syphilitic osteomyelitis, a homosexual man presenting with headache. So this is a case of 27-year-old male patient, HIV negative, with history of homosexuality, presented with severe headache and tenderness in the left frontal region that lasted a few weeks. There was no associated symptom. The patient consulted a neurosurgeon for his problem, and MRI brain with gadolinium was ordered to rule out any organic etiologies. The imaging showed a lesion in the left frontal bone, showing high T2 flare signal intensity and restriction on diffusion represented by high diffusion-weighted imaging and low ADC map. It enhances after gadolinium administration with overlying soft tissue thickening and swelling and underlying meningeal enhancement. So several laboratory testing were ordered revealing high inflammatory markers. The screening test for syphilis, including treponema pallidum hemagglutination and venereal disease research laboratory indicated positive results. So, a diagnosis of secondary syphilis was concluded and the lesion was regarded as calvarial syphilitic osteomyelitis. So, a course of 14 days, ceftriaxone antibiotic was administered as treatment. A follow-up three months later demonstrates the disappearance of the headache, the inflammatory marker was significantly decreased, and MRI brain was done to follow up the lesion. When compared to the MRI brain at initial presentation, the lesion shows decrease in the intra and extra osseous inflammatory process and decrease in the diffusion restriction. A close look at the T1 sequence after gadolinium administration shows, in addition to the improvement of the soft tissue swelling, a complete resolution of the meningeal enhancement. So, skull lesion can be discovered incidentally on radiologic imaging or can manifest with symptom. A variety of neoplastic, including benign or malignant conditions, and non-neoplastic, including infectious, metabolic, and other conditions, may involve the skull and pose a diagnostic challenge. One of the cause of solitary skull lesion is syphilis that is considered as a great imitator that can influence the skull and mimics many other diseases. MRI brain has an essential role in providing a non-invasive technique to assess the skull lesion. 
Some skull lesions have distinguishing features on MRI, such as fibrous dysplasia that show expansive lesion with cystic clitic component and ground glass fibrous tissue, as well as anorismal cyst that shows the characteristic fluid to fluid level, and the epidermoid cyst that show high T2 and high diffusion weighted image. However, other skull lesions, such as metastatic region or eosinophilic granuloma, have similar features of our case, showing involvement of the periosteum, the soft tissue, and then meninge. Thus, the importance of the combinations of a good history, laboratory testing, dedicated imaging, and follow-up to avoid unnecessary invasive procedure. So this case highlights the importance to reintroduce syphilis into the daily routine of radiologists. As this great imitator is challenging and may present with uncommon manifestations. And given that the current decade is witnessing a resurgence of syphilis, which coincided with an increase in homosexuality. So the combination of clinical information, laboratory testing, and MRI features of skull lesions help to determine an accurate diagnosis. I got my reference from these articles, and thank you. Okay, we have one presentation left. Our last case is from Tanzania, presented by Dr. Happiness Swai. And the case is about pulmonary artery aneurysms associated with TB. Just keep in mind that right after this case, we will go to an intermission so that the judges can deliberate. Stay tuned. My name is Happiness Swai. And Greetings, everyone. My name is Happiness Swai, and I'm a medical doctor working at the Akaya Kikwete Cardiac Institute, located in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania of more than four centimeter of the pulmonary Okay, we'll wait one minute before we present our last case. In the meantime, we just, uh, we can go through the 18 cases that we have seen so far so that everyone can start picking their top choices and come up with the one that they want to choose for the People's Choice Award. Just try, uh, whenever we go to the intermission, you're going to see in the screen, we will show a poll and you will see the instructions of how to vote on that poll. Greetings, everyone. Happiness Swai, and I'm a medical doctor working at the Akaya Kikwete Cardiac Institute, located in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And today I'm going to present to you a case of bilateral multiple pulmonary artery aneurysm associated with cavitary pulmonary tuberculosis. By definition, pulmonary artery aneurysm refers to a focal dilatation of more than four centimeters of 
the pulmonary arterial system, and this usually constitutes less than 1% of the aneurysm occurring in the thoracic cavity. Pulmonary tuberculosis usually comes with several complications. However, Rasmussen's aneurysm is a rare sequelae of pulmonary TB, resulting from the gradual weakening of the pulmonary arterial wall from the adjacent tubercular cavity, leading to thinning and pseudoaneurysm formation. About 20 to 60 percent of patients with pulmonary arterial aneurysm will die from aneurysm rupture if not intervened. I'm going to present a 24-year-old man who was a nursing student who was referred from upcountry to our setting for expert management. His past medical history was unremarkable. However, he was diagnosed with pulmonary TB based on constitutional symptoms and chest X-ray findings, and he had completed a six-month course of anti-TB medications. He was somewhat symptom-free for about three weeks, where he developed recurrent episodes of breathlessness, awareness of heartbeats, and coughing blood, which he had gradually worsened and persisted for about four weeks prior to this index visit. On physical examination, it revealed conjunctival and palmar pallor. However, there are no stigmata of connective tissue disorders, systemic vasculitis, or congenital heart disease. On respiratory system examination, he had bilateral symmetrical chest movement. However, dullness and reduced breath sounds were noted on the mammary and inframammary region bilaterally on percussion and auscultation respectively. On cardiovascular system examination, he had accentuated second heart sound with early diastolic and holosystolic mama at the pulmonic and tricuspid area, respectively. We went further to investigate our patient, whereby he had iron deficiency anemia with HB of 8.18 gram per deciliter. Sputum culture revealed Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which was sensitive to ciprofloxacin and gentamicin, and gene expert was positive. Serological test for HIV, hepatitis B and C, and syphilis was negative. We had different differential diagnosis. However, we had to investigate further by doing imaging, and this is a chest X-ray posterior anterior view, which shows bilateral ovoid shaped perihilar opacity extending all the way to the lower lung zone with loss of left cardiac border. The second image is a CT chest axial view which shows bilateral multiple pulmonary pseudoaneurysm of variable sizes with surrounding hematoma and cystic changes as depicted by the large arrows shown in this image. The third image is a coronal view chest CT, which also shows that there are multiple bilateral pseudoaneurysm involving both the right and the left lung with surrounding hematoma. The fourth image is a volume rendered CT, which also shows that there were multiple pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm, however, the main pulmonary artery was of normal size and caliber together with the ascending arc and the descending aorta. Our patient was counseled about the prognosis and he was, um, however, he refused treatment. And to bring this uh, discussion to an end, I would like to enlighten physician that when you have a patient with intractable hemoptysis, after completion of anti-TB course, you should also think of suspicious of pulmonary arterial aneurysm. Furthermore, despite its rarity, early recognition and timely surgical intervention is crucial in reducing the morbidity and preventing the attributed mortality. Thank you for listening. The time has come the time we've all been waiting for. So this was our last case. We will now proceed to show the poll and everyone get ready to vote while the judges deliberate on the best cases. You will see the screen, um, the instructions for the poll will be on the screen. It's important to say that they, uh, please just 
do one vote per participant. One participant can choose one case. Jerusalem, I call me. I don't know what to Jerusalem, I call me. Oh, 
announcements uh, as we said at the beginning like this year you're closer because that camera doesn't feel awesome. yeah yeah, oh, yeah sure. uh, anyway um let's start with one that is no controversy we didn't um we don't have any control over the people's choice award so we're gonna announce that one first like um you guys voted we just waited for the software to give us like the magic answer and we are happy to report that um let's see dr daniel moenga from kenya is a people's choice award for the case of large gossipy bombers related to remote surgery so congratulations um and uh, just a reminder that the the selected cases um uh do get uh, cash awards and then um, another more academically proper award aside from the cash is that um, the winners can also um, participate in our radial program. Like, so you can have access to our uh, management learning system for a year. And um, also the cases, if they, they can work with us and we are gonna provide mentorship to write up the cases so they can be published. And uh, um, one of our partners has been an applied radiology that is willing to um, review and accept the case, um, the cases selected for this competition. So again, with that in mind, the first winner was Daniel Moenga from Kenya, and we're gonna move on. Yeah, so um, this was tough, it was heated, you know. Um, as you know, we had to bring in our guest judge, Karen, um, who provided a lot of guidance. Um, and um, tie break in um, role, because Hansel and I, we don't agree on any of that, you know, <laughs> outfits, style. So with that, we had to um, reach to our funders to see, um, you know, because the cases were so great and um, we, we had a hard time choosing. So we had to check our back pockets and talk to people and see if we can um, include more winners today. So we have two um, third place winners. Um, we're going to start with that. Um, um, the, one of them is from um, Tanzania, you know, mm -hmm. 
Uh, the, th well, the first third place winner is um, Dr. Rachel Kajuna with the difficult coffin infant. Give a round of applause. <laughs> and um, this, the additional uh, third place uh, award will go to, uh, to a place close to my heart, to Dr. Kedebe Goffer. Uh, for his case on soft tissue ossification in Liberia from JFK. Congratulations. Yeah, so I, like I said, it, it was tough. So in addition to adding a second third place winner, we have um, two second place winners um, who, who each get $500, right? The, the third place gets 250 as in the people's choice as well. And the first second place winner is um, Dr. Ndaro Daniel, pediatric brain injury from Kenya. Ah, nice. We've got Kenya taking it all in. All right, all right. And our, um, our and additional second, second, um, second place uh, is going to Dr. Nera Halili. <laughs> uh, for a media stand, I had a disease. She's from Iran. They are first time participants. So thank you um, to our um, friends in the Middle East for participating. And you get the second, the second place. The only thing that we agree on, and uh, Karen uh, support us there, was on the first place. The first place was by consensus. And we only have one, one first place winner. So you want to say? Uh, I, I would if I can find it. <laughs> All right. So our first place winner is Dr. Hamim Rusheke. Um, do you want to say that? I'm, I'm not a pediatric. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, yeah. uh, I would say that's Ragipagos parasitic twin. Yes, I, I, from Tanzania. Uh, we are, um, again, we're, we're going to uh, celebrate with you guys by uh, uh, showing the, in the screen, like like the winners. So you you have a screenshot of that, and you can hold us accountable for what we just said and and the extra money that we promise. And um, and we're gonna again play some music. But I think that is uh, is that time of the day where we yeah. say That's that time. we are done yeah. with the program. Yeah. Good. Good. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks again to our keynote speaker, Dr. Frank Minja, for the excellent. Um, you know, talk inspiring. Um, thanks a lot to our guest judge, Karen. Um, hopefully we, um, you know, we, we um, keep connecting. Um, again, this is a, a safe space, this is a family. Please feel free to reach out to any one of us, okay? And for whatever you need. And, and thanks to the people in the room that made it all happen. Oh, yeah, Yadel, Mohammed. Oh, let's see. Uh, uh, Monica. <laughs> And oh, Herman, you know, who's not here? I'm uh, missing yeah. someone there. Yeah. All right. And, um, and last, um, again, we want to acknowledge that um, it was uh, co organized with the pen um, between the, the pen uh, radiology, like the adult hospital, and the children's hospital of Philadelphia, and um, with the help from uh, our friends at the Center for Global Health. And, um, we also want to acknowledge that this time around, this is our second time doing this, and uh, we got a lot more cases, we got a lot more uh, participants, and we had a lot more people during the live uh, webinar. So thank you for spreading the word, and uh, we'll see you in a year. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.